Director for Library Information Services, uh, Medjinet Molopiane, Deputy Director, Teaching and Learning, our host, um, Mr. Lashan Naika, Deputy Director, Collection Development, Mdate uh, Mondema Diva, our esteemed guest speaker, Professor Zondi, our honored guests who are presenters today, um, our honors and um, undergraduate students, ladies and gentlemen, um, you are welcome. Um, this is one of those occasions that we pride ourselves as the University of the Free State. We, we, our director like to say we send a trend. We are trend centers in this area where we are encouraging our undergrads uh, to move towards um, the research paradigm. You would know that based on the vision of the university, Vision 130, we want to increase the number of postgrads from the current number to about 30% of the student population. So if you look at our student population, which hovers around 40,000, um, we are looking at a, a minimum of um, around uh, 12,000 postgrads. And, and among those, half of them should be PhD level. And, and, and looking around this room, uh, looking at the presentation, what we're going to get, uh, that number is now down to about mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, about 10,000, already at 2,000 here. Yeah. We'll be re uh, registering for postgraduate next year. Um, uh, that's that's an encouraging sign uh, for, for our university. And and you would know that um, one of the one of the things that you are currently doing, which is going to follow this list has. Uh, around um, the second part, uh, the third semester of our university, we will be using, we will be having our honors, uh, our mass, a postgraduate and researcher seminar, where we will showcase the number of researchers that are available within the university, um, who, who are experts in different fields, and they've made a mark. And, and, and that process, we, it's it's going to begin in coming few weeks. You would see from our YouTube channel, we would be showcasing them, but not only showcasing them, but also showcasing the labs where this research comes from. So as a library, it's, it's one of those. So already our, our program director has indicated where our restrooms are. We've, we've taken a liberty of give you water. We also have uh, soft drinks coming later. Um, unfortunately, although it's Friday, we don't have hot, uh, hot drinks. Uh, I, would, I would have preferred, but you know that the university is on austerity measures, so we don't have the budget for the hot drinks. We would have preferred some little bit of wine, um, but be that as it may, feel at home. You are at home, actually. You don't have to feel at home. You are at home. And I want to say welcome. I'm looking, we're looking forward to presentation. To the colleagues who are joining online, we also welcome you, um, and uh, we hope you you also participate uh, um, profitably like the colleagues who are here on the floor. With that few words, I'd like to say thank you very much. Welcome, feel at home. Thank you, Daddy Charlie. And how Helen Nakere and all protocol observed. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we would like now to get an address from the DDC of Research and Internalization. Inter. 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 Internalization. Never. Internationalization. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor um, Vasu Reddy. And this will happen through visual.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will then move to the next session. I would like to call Nir Kaliel. Um, Ayanda, please assist with the feedback, please. Thank you. I would like to call Mayor Hadibulai Mushotla, who's going to be ushering us in this next session. Good morning and welcome. I'm Hadi Mushotla. Welcome again. I'll be coordinating or facilitating the session for National and Agricultural Sciences. Uh, we have students that have submitted their assignments, uh, as the demo lab has indicated, undergraduate and honor students. So the first session that we're going to have, we'll have computer science students. Uh, we have computer science students that will be presenting. It was a group assignment uh, that was compiled by Kay Smith, uh, Kay Kolanchu, Fender and Smith. I would like them to come here, the two that will be presenting, to come and uh, brace us here. And then the one that will be presenting will come here. It's a group assignment. And the title of their topic is Peer-to-Peer -to -peer Tutoring by Ben Smith, Amohelo Kolanchu. Christian Fenter and Jocelyn Smith. They are from the Department of Computer Science. Welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Baron Smith, and I'll be presenting for my group, Jocelyn Smith and Christian Venter. Unfortunately, Kamal Golanchuk could not be here today. We will be introducing you to the software engineering project we did on the STEM peer-to-peer tutoring system. The scenario we presented with was the University of Free State wanted to create a program to improve retention rates for first year students in the computer science department. To, to do this, they decided to introduce a system allowing second and third year students to tutor first year students. This is our team. I was project manager and developer. Kam Karanshu was the lead developer. Christian Fenton was a software quality manager and developer. Jocelyn Smith was a UX designer and developer. Now for project definition names. In order to facilitate second and third year students to tutor first year students, we decided to create a virtual classroom focusing on enhancing learning interaction. We created a collaborative classroom where, similar to Blackboard, where students can do quizzes, have an online live chat, and more to motivate students to really get in to learn, stick with university. We decided to gamify it, implementing a leaderboard with badges and points. Points would be awarded based on good attendance excellent grades, 
and any coding problems were might complete. Other features include user authentication, user-friendly interfaces, cross-platform design, intuitive dashboards, and module-specific sections. During the course of the project, we created over 148 figures, over 214 pages. This, this included 22 use cases, 21 sequence diagrams, four state charts, 23 CLC cards, 23 UML classes with one large UML diagram, software management plan and for quote for the client, the database design and 54 user interfaces. Now this entire document in with the real life situation be handed over to the design team for programmers to implement it. Now the design approach we used was an agile methodology following the unified process. We followed the unified process to ensure fault free software was developed on time within budget that meets our clients' needs. The unified process follows stages from requirements, analysis, information, and design. Here's a timeline of our entire project. We started in early July meeting our clients, ascertaining what requirements they desired, then moving on to our analysis phase, followed by the design phase. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we could not implement the system. But we managed to design the system fully, only needing coding implementation. We didn't have any findings really, but we did encounter a few challenges. We there were many, many features we wanted to include to make it more of a real life system, but we had to delimit the scope in order to develop the system within time. We also struggled to manage all the different components effectively. And the file integration was tricky as each part had to flow with another to ensure a seamless combination and a smooth workflow. As you can see here, we have a QR code showing a demo of our system, prototype if you will. You can now scan the code and it will take you to a website where you can view our program. And first online, please take a screenshot if you want to see it. We have printed out copies if you want to collect them from us afterward. And now for a video of our program. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, we will finish the whole NES uh, program and then the questions will follow. So thank you so much. Uh, later on when the program, the, the NES uh, faculty are done, then we'll continue with the, with the questions. So thank you so much. Uh, we are going to go to the second presenter, which is from the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. Uh, the recording will be played, but the title of the topic is Proposal for Student Housing Challenges in Sunnyside, Pretoria, South Africa, by Ruan Silas. And then we also have a supervisor that is here with us today because uh, Ruan was unable to come. So, Mashalaba, Prof. Mashalaba, you can join us in front just to support uh, Ruan in his absence, but we will play the recording. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruan, for the presentation. Thank you, Prof, for supporting Ruan. Uh, the other thing that I forgot to outline, please, all the questions that you have, jot them down so that when the session ends, we can take those questions and the presenters will be able to answer all the questions that we have regarding the presentation that they did. Our next presentation. Our next presentation is from Plant Science, uh, an honor student who, the title of this presentation is Unraveling the Functions of the Modified Cell Wall in Thesha and Thesha LR9 with Infection by Lucinia Trusinisa. Uh, Nchabani will be presenting that presentation. Please welcome Nchabani. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair, for introducing me and the topic. Uh, just to give uh, context, uh, Thatcher L9 and Thatcher are the resistant and uh, susceptible cultivars, and that Paxinia tricina is the is the pathogen. So to give to give background, uh, this will be the out, uh, outline of of my presentation. To give a brief uh, background, wheat is a an essential agricultural crop and one of the leading staple food sources in many countries. Uh, one of the one of the pathogens or uh, biotic factors that that share an environment with wheat are the Paxinial species, which are which are the rust fungi, and then uh, are considered economically important as they affect growth and yield, and also they pose a, a major in a food insecurity risk. Therefore, it is important to develop more protection strategies uh, uh, against these pathogens for wheat. And then uh, these rust pathogens have developed uh, sophisticated feeding mechanisms and structures, such as the Hostoria mother cell and the Hostoria, which uh, secrete enzymes such as which secrete enzymes such as cell wall degrading enzymes and uh, carbohydrate active enzymes. That uh, that facilitate the degradation of the cell wall, plant cell wall, and and um, metabolism of carbohydrates to acquire nutrients from the from the plant. And then previous studies from our lab have demonstrated how cell wall modification in resistant plants protected the plants against uh, fungal infections. Other studies revealed that uh, callus deposition strengthened the cell wall against against fungi uh, against against fungal infections. And as a as a part of hypersensitive response, this uh this this these mechanisms uh, significantly reduced the, the, the fungal growth. 
And then even though there is enough information regarding the resistance of wheat to rust fungi, there is, however, a, uh, a lack of information on, on how these cell wall degrading enzymes are involved in the uh, in the de degradation of the cell wall and the release of, of, of fungal spores to the leaf surface. And then uh, we therefore propose that studying carbohydrate metabolism during this interaction um, could shed, share more, shed more light on the new biochemical uh, rust control strategies. This study is aimed to elucidate whether the leaf epidemic rupture is a function of cell wall degrading enzymes uh, that catalyze the degradation of the cell wall or the epidemics. The objectives were to use fluorescent, fluorescent light microscopy to determine the fungal growth in the leaf in the leaf in the leaf tissue, to use scanning electron microscope uh, to determine the roles of cell wall degrading enzymes in the cell wall. Um, and then to quantify, quantify the resistant marker protein uh, activities in the susceptible and resistant cultivars, and then also quantify and characterize one uh, metabolic protein. The wheat cultivars were the wheat cultivars susceptible and resistant were grown in a greenhouse cubicle and then planted in that professional uh, planting soil, and then the rust rust uh, spores were inoculated onto the wheat seedlings seedlings using a pressure uh, vacuum pump, and then the plant tissue was harvested at those time, time points for, uh, uh, for, for, for microscopy and for uh, enzymatical, enzymatic, enzymatic analysis. Then pictures of the leaves were taken uh, at 14 days after inoculation, and then uh, some of the leaves were stained with UV text to, uh, and then analyzed using a fluorescent light microscope. And then other leaves were dried and then coated with gold particles to make them conductive and then visualized under a scanning electron microscope. And then the, the pictures showed us that the infected susceptible plants showed success, uh, symptoms of successful infection, whereas the uh, resistant plant showed no signs of infection. And then we used, we, we used fluorescent light microscopy to visualize what happens inside the leaf. We saw that here um, in the infected susceptible at four days post inoculation, the leaf uh, the fungal structures were already branching out inside the leaf. And then at seven days in the susceptible plants, uh, the, 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 the leaf epidemic had already been ruptured, releasing the spores into uh, on the plants uh, on the plant surface. And then at in the infected resistant plant at seven days. We saw that uh, a spore had already germinated and located a stomata here. And when, when we look inside the leaf, we saw that uh, underneath that stomata, there were two dead cells here, which is a property of um, hypersensitive response as a way to stop uh, further infection or penetration of the pathogen. And then we use scanning electron microscope to determine the, 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 the role of cell wall degrading enzymes. And then at, in the IR, in the resistant plants at three days, we saw that there was no um, symptoms of uh, successful info, uh, in infection. And then in the susceptible plants at five days, we saw a hallmark of successful stomatal penetration. But then at this point, there were no anatomical differences or changes on the leaves on the leaf starch. But then at seven days in the susceptible plants, we saw that next to a successfully penetrated stomata, there was an opening that released the spores to the leaf surface. And then when we looked uh, closer to the opening, we saw a peeling effect uh, on the top layer of the, of the epidemics. And then when we use a higher magnification, we saw that the, the peeling effect revealed the, revealed the cellulose, uh, the, the cell wall fibers. And then what we saw interestingly was that uh, there was a property of um, cell, cellulose microfiber aggregation, which is the uh, property of uh, the removal of cell wall polymers that hold the cell wall fibers together, causing them to aggregate or fall back onto themselves, which confirms the, uh, the enzymatic degradation of the cell wall. And then when we slice through the leaves to look at to, to look at what happens inside the leaf, we saw that in the resistant plants at seven days, the, uh, the leaf structure was still intact with all the cell borders or cell walls still well defined because there was no successful infection as it's the resistant cultivar. And then in the susceptible cultivar, we saw that we saw the, the fungal structures branching throughout the leaf until the spores were released to the surface of the leaf. And then when we look closer, we see the fungal hyphae branching out within the leaf uh, until the, uh, the, the spores are released to the surface. And this 
damaged all uh, the, the leaf the leaf structure within the leaf. And then we we further uh, and then we further quantified the uh, potential resistant resistant marker proteins, uh, which is the using the enzymatic act, uh, analysis. We did the beta one three glucanase activity invertase and fructanase activity under those reaction conditions. And then uh, what we saw is that oh okay context beta one three glucanase um, beta one three glucanase is it, beta one three glucanase plays an important role in the regulation of calose calose which is a, a a polymer that strengthens the cell wall. So, um, and then this enzyme also is also used as the resistant mark. Then what we saw in the early stages of infection was that in the resistant resistant cultivars, the 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 the, the, the enzyme the beta glucanase activity was repressed. This was to allow calose to be uh, to be deposited on the cell wall to strengthen the cell wall. And then at the later stage, at 14 days, it was then upregulated to remove the the, the calose from the cell wall because it had already prevented the infection. And then uh, in the susceptible cultivars, the reaction, the activity will remain more or less the same throughout. And then for invertase and fructinase activity, we saw that in the resistant cultivars, the, 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 the activity of these enzymes was induced at the early stages of infection, at day one for invertase and day one and seven days for fructinase. This was involved in the production of glucose, which is used for energy production and uh, cell wall synthesis. And then what we also saw interestingly was that invertase gave us differential uh, induction profiles at day one and day seven and, and, and day 14, which uh, prompted us to further characterize and investigate this enzyme invertase. And then we used the pH optimum temperature, thermostability and kinetic studies to, uh, to characterize invertase. And then the pH studies showed us that um, the the invertase found in the IR samples was mostly active in the in pH at pH five, which is slightly acidic, um, and was associated was associated with uh, the cell wall. And then the invertase found in the susceptible plants was 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 mostly active at pH six, which is slightly basic and associated with the cytoplasm. The same the same profile was seen in the at fourteen days. This was this is one uh, day one. This is fourteen days. And then this means that um, this the cell wall bound in invertase or cell wall associated invertase could be a future resistant marker protein. And then the thermostability and temperature studies showed us that the two enzymes uh, had had similar had the same uh, uh, temperature optimum at 40 degrees Celsius at day one and day 14, and then similar thermostability. Um, at, at day one and day 14, which makes sense because these enzymes were sourced from the same plant. Uh, this is more technical, but then uh, um, what we did is that we used kinetic studies, the values Vmax and Km, and then what they showed us is that uh, the, the invertase found in the IR and the, the invertase found in the IR samples utilized the, the, the substrate that we used, which is sucrose, differently compared to the one found in the IS, both at day one and day 14, which means that these enzymes are two different enzymes or they are isozymes. And then conclusions that came on uh, were that phenotypic, phenotypic studies and the microscopic results showed us, showed us that the, the resistant plants used an HR defense mechanism against fungal infection, and then the susceptible plants uh, susceptible plants show, uh, displayed susceptibility symptoms uh, as seen by the substantial fungal biomass. And then um, the beta glucanase activity was reduced at day one and day seven in the IR, and then upregulated at 14 days. The timing of this enzyme's activity, enzyme activity suppression and induction, reflects the, importance of this, the importance of this enzyme in regulation of calories. Interestingly, the invertase and fructinase activity was induced at day one and day seven, suggesting that these enzymes uh, were involved in the in the in the production of glucose, which is a precursor molecule for uh, energy production and cell wall synthesis. And then invertase characterization kinetics and kinetic studies suggested that there were two um, isozymes or uh, two two isozymes of the invertase in the IR and the IS. And then in addition, we have demonstrated that the cell wall degrading enzymes facilitate the exposure of spores on the leaf surface. 
The cell wall intake of the IR sample set 14 days support the invertase and beta glucanase activity. We then concluded that the cell wall is degraded in the susceptible cultivar, uh, but uh, and 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 but re re reinforced in the resistant cultivar. This is due to the different regulation of carbohydrate active enzymes in the susceptible and resistant cultivars. Future studies, uh, future studies uh, will will study this enzyme at a much more de deeper level. And then what, one of the re uh, outputs of this study was was obtained as this study was presented at one of the national co uh, conferences. This were my references and thank you. Special thanks to my supervisors and for you to policy. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm hoping we are jotting down those questions. We are left with one presenter from computer science. I'm going to welcome Naidin uh, from computer science. She's an honor student. Her topic is virtual reality computer assembly, building technical skills through immersive learning. Please welcome Nadine. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nadine, and I would like to welcome you to the future of learning. Before I start, I would like to ask you guys a question. Have any of you ever built or assembled or even looked at some parts of a computer? That is why I'm here today. Great. Good luck. Luckily, that's not your job. That's my job. So the reason for this whole project was that there's a critical knowledge gap in the first year UFS students regarding computer assembly. So according to Dr. Boerta, computer hardware lecturer at the Department of Computer Science, more than 30% of first year computer science students have absolutely zero experience or knowledge of computer hardware. Therefore, this project came to light. So my abstract was broken down into much smaller parts. Um, so the project that I developed aimed to create a VR application for computer hardware education. With the help of this VR applications, students will identify components, learn functions, and assemble computers virtually. Interactive elements enable exploration and real-time feedback. The evaluation of this application involves and focuses on effectiveness and user experience, offering an interactive learning approach with potential educational enhancements. Now, the problem definition is that learning about computer components and assembly can be challenging. The reasons for this is that acquiring resources can be expensive as well as time consuming. Anyone who has a computer knows that these parts can rank quite high. Additionally, traditional methods may not provide a comprehensive understanding. And lastly, computer components are fragile and can easily be damaged by inexperienced students. Therefore, the aim was to develop an effective and affordable solution, which is a VR application that provides immersive and engaging learning experiences. It should also simulate the process of building a functional computer. It will then allow students to practice skills and gain confidence in computer building without any real world risks. Now, there's just a, a small video that briefly explains um, the whole application that I developed. Um, it's a lot more than that. I only have 10 minutes to um, present this whole application. But essentially, this application should provide an immersive and interactive learning environment. Additionally, it should feature realistic 3D models of computer components. It then also features a virtual workspace to assemble these components. And then lastly, it also um, features educational resources and health material to assist students throughout the computer assembly process. Now, the technologies involved to develop this application was Unity 3D Engine, which is a very popular as well as free engine that allows for VR development. Additionally, I use Blender and Blender Kit, which is an application that allows for 3D modeling. And Blender Kit um, 
has an extensive collection of 3D models, which is where I retrieved my computer components from. I use the C-sharp coding language to, to code the logic of this um, application in Unity. And lastly, the Oculus Quest was used, um, it was provided by the university for the development, and that was the hardware that was used to um, facilitate this um, wireless experience. The methodology I used for this um, whole project was the Agile software development, which is short iterations called sprints, but it was personalized for a single developer. So that's where the personal scrum comes in. Um, this methodology can handle the iterative and rapidly evolving nature of a VR development application. So the main issue with this application in terms of its environmental um, impact is cyber sickness. This is a type of motion sickness that occurs due to the mismatch between sensory inputs in the brain that the brain receives and what the body experiences in reality. This phenomenon um, affects up to 95% of your um, users, which highly inhibited my development at the start um, of this project. Um, and this could discourage students from using the application. However, with frequent exposure, it has been known to subside, luckily for me. Um, additionally, some students could be apprehensive towards the Oculus headset due to its foreign nature and unfamiliarity with the, the technology, as well as discomfort. So this solution was evaluated via a moderated usability test um, in the form of formative and summative evaluation. The magic number five was used in terms of the sample size, which if you know that is proven to reveal up to 80% of the major um, issues in your, your artifact, which is very helpful. Um, and then within this usability test, performance, self-reported and issue-based metrics were recorded. Um, so this graph compared to the one on the first slide reveals that the, if the, um, the solution was valuable and effective, however, in-depth um, research should be done, and that is what I'm based my master's on. I'm continuing the study on this application. I'm using the design science research and methodology, so I hope to improve this um, application a lot more. And here's my references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think I'm going to open the floor for questions. I will start with Nadine because her presentation just started now. Uh, on your presentation, you indicated that the cyber sickness that the students that are in computer science are struggling with. How do you overcome that? Because we've seen that we tend to focus a lot on our gadgets. And sometimes when you talk to somebody, he's not there because he's focusing here. But in your case, because you are working with the hardware, how do you overcome the, 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 that cyber space? One of the first things um, that we, so I, I should note that the application was already implemented in the first year of hardware students. It's already been rolled out. The first year students are already using the application. So one of the first things we changed in the application is just the orientation of the objects. N narrowing the field of view just to a smaller work area already significantly improved the cyber sickness because you don't have to turn around and walk around as much um, as the first iteration. So that immediately immensely reduced the cyber sickness complaints, um, which I feel like it's not as much as a problem anymore already. So just reducing the field of view and the range of motion that is necessary to complete the objective um, significantly reduced the cyber sickness. Thank you very much. My second question, I know that computer science, they are the ones that are responsible for our lab that we have in the library maker space. They were very much involved. I saw on your presentation you indicated 3D. Uh, all the applications that you use for 3D, maybe just if I'm interested, what applications are you using on the 3D machine and how does it work? So the, the Oculus headset um, has a lot of applications on it, mainly used for gaming. So we had to sideload the application on there. Um, so it, it reduced the, the connect needed um, 
between the application and the Oculus Go and the application. Um, and for, for Blender, where the 3D models came from, that's not my strong suit. Okay. 3D modeling was not my strong suit, so I had to search um, in depth for, for models that was freely available for me to complete this application. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can we give you a round of applause? Are there any questions for Nadine before she goes down regarding her presentation? Before I move on to the second presenter, the second last presenter that was here. From the floor, any questions? Okay, silence means consent. So thank you so much, Nadine, for the brilliant presentation. Uh, regarding Mr. Njabane's presentation, do we have questions on the plant that we saw there, all the technical issues that they went to finally have the product that they have? I saw that day, Dr. Mafa is here to come and support. Thank you so much for, for, for coming. Is there any questions regarding uh, unraveling the functions of modified cell wall in Pesha? I remember Nadine, when she started, she wanted to know how many of us have played around with computers. So probably the question would be with your uh, field of study. The reason there are no questions is because we are not that clued up with that. But if there are no questions from the floor regarding uh, your topic, thank you very much. Any questions from Dr. Mafa or you're fine? Um, uh, I just want to find out out of uh, interest, <laughs> what did you, uh, what is the take home message from, from the project? What did you learn? Uh, is there anything that um, you, you found interesting through the, the honors project? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mof, for the question. Uh, what I, I have learned from this uh, whole experience was that um, we, as, as we wanted to determine the, 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 the mechanism and, roles, the, and the role of the cellular degrading enzymes in facilitating the exposure of the spores to the leaf samples, we saw that it is actually uh, um, a, an enzymatic activity that allows the, um, the cell wall to, to, to be broken down in order to release the spores to the surface. And then uh, in addition to in addition to all the strategies that are already in place, such as the cellular pre, um, such as the plant breeding and the molecular techniques that uh, uh, scientists already used to uh, to fight to 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 to, to fight off the, the 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 effects of uh, rust pathogens against uh, against wheat, there the, there is a, a, a possibility of. Um, of uh, of finding new strategies uh, going the the biochemical route, in addition to to the other strategies involved. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no questions, I will move on to the third presenter. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Javani. Uh, the topic that we had from Evan and Regional Planning, it was Proposal for Student Housing Challenge in Sun Sunnyside, Pretoria. Uh, Prof, I think, will take the questions if there are questions from the floor. From my side, regarding the accommodation issue in general, we've seen with students when they come to university, the accommodation is a very serious issue. But now, uh, Ruan here is focusing mainly on Sunnyside. And the challenges that they've he has identified, would you say, Prof, based on the topic that he has done, did he manage to come up with solutions to address the challenges that he picked up from the study? Um, obviously, not 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 everything uh, could have been solved by site selection, for example. But uh, to identify the challenges that are faced with uh, uh, that universities are facing was the most important thing. And then obviously 
to then go around and do the land salvage to identify what other challenges are there. For example, uh, uh, he identified the issues regarding uh, safety and security in, in, in those areas. But even planning in itself cannot solve that. So that is a law and order type of uh, a solution. So you wouldn't be able to uh, solve everything uh, with regard to it. But student accommodation in itself I mean, is a major problem. Uh, because even the University of Fish State is say about 40, 45,000 students, but maybe we could only have accommodated 10% of it. Um, and we see obviously uh, quite a lot of uh, challenges with real estate outside the universities themselves. What's happening in Victoria is uh, happening here around CUT or around the University of Fish State. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Any questions from the floor regarding student accommodation? Thank you. Um, it, it's a very thorny issue. One, particularly because there's a, an incredible exploitative practice that's emerging. And oftentimes we want to ask because the university does not have, I almost want to say, control over what's happening outside of its campus. That, that the students are left on their own to somehow navigate with private um, accommodation. If the university does not have, we're expecting that your town planning policies, municipal policies to, should really be starting to take interest as far as the, the private accommodation that serves, that, that is actually constructed to serve a student, a student that is, um, an individual that goes to school that's depending on a particular funder. I'm wondering about if, if you map these dynamics, if, if the students can go, uh, and this is probably something that they can take up at later stage, if you map this particular dynamics, um, what could be a, a possible university intervention? I mean, we, we, we cannot leave this to a student and their parents. What could be a possible university intervention? As part of it. beyond the fact that they think when they have done what they call accreditation, it's enough. You know, there's, there's this baseline practice that they think when they've done a, a so-called accreditation, it's enough. And that's, this is something that's done once. And for the rest of the year, students are expected to actually negotiate with, with private owners that do not take interest on a student, a student life, both social life, but also academic life. For that question, Prof, would you be able to answer that? Yes, thank you, sir. I'm I'm gonna try to answer this uh, question in three ways. Um, first, let me start uh, from the municipality side. Um, maybe I should say at times I uh, act as a chairperson of the municipal planning tribunal that approves or disapproves developments in town. It's an independent body um, appointed by council. Now, I'm going to tell you what the practice has been in the last, uh, say, three or four years where I've been involved. Um, all student housing applications that we receive from the municipalities, we inspect all of them before approval. However, uh, I'll tell you right now. There's only one that I've been to that probably even meets hygiene standards. Um, the number of people that uh, that are staying there, and then other issues you uh, that maybe university has not dealt with at this stage is that you would have maybe a law student who probably goes to classes maybe in the evenings or something like that. I don't know uh, what's happening. Mm -hmm. Staying with uh, maybe a medical student, probably who starts work, uh, um, goes, going to class at seven or eight in the morning, and then at times we we get uh, we go to the student houses. The ones that are accredited, they're overcrowded. 
Um, you have um, guys and girls just staying in a, uh, in a manner that you wouldn't really, as a parent, maybe uh, try to say, okay, I am comfortable with my little girl staying here, for example. So there are those challenges that uh, municipalities are able to deal with. And um, over and above that, there's also uh, requirements that do not look at the fact that some, some, if not most of the students do not have access to cars, vehicles, uh, but in, uh, then there are parking standards. So there's that answer that I'm giving you that the municipality itself is struggling with dealing with the land use of uh, uh, student accommodation. Even right now, there's a, I think one of our colleagues at, uh, at Urban Planning has been appointed to come up with a policy for student housing all around uh, uh, the industry, but it's still a municipal uh, a bylaw. It's not a university bylaw or anything. So the university at this particular stage is not obligated by law uh, to solve the problems that it causes, because if each and every year I advertise all around the world for 40,000 people to come and, and, and to come to Bloemfontein and study, but I don't care about where they are going to stay. And I say, listen, we will we'll find a way. So uh, investors are not are, are obliged by law uh, to solve the problems that they cause. And then I'm going to answer again uh, as well personal, because I do have uh, property that has the student, obviously students and stuff like that. The money that uh, is paid by NSS has even caused me to give a notice to one of my tenants to say, listen, I want you out uh, by June, because the tenant that I'm going to get being paid for by NSS is probably going to pay double if not even more, and they'll even pay rates and taxes and levies and stuff like that. However, the property itself um, is going to be, I would say, overcrowded. Instead of having maybe a limit of about 3.5 people, now uh, 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 NSFOS and, and that type of application can allow even more. But this is in a building that probably has uh, about maybe eight parking bays. But in each unit, you're gonna have about four or five students staying there. Already you have the challenge with uh, engineering services, water, sewer, electricity, and all those type of things. Because you've got more people that are staying on the property. Uh, um, so the quality of life is not really improved. And then um, I will then maybe give a, the last answer regarding maybe uh, from an academic side here um, at the university starting these land uses. We are seeing that, uh, I mean, we had a student last year that was doing masters uh, regarding this uh, whole student education of, uh, um, of Brandwag, uh, I think the university as well, and even the CBD because there's opportunities for, 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 for those things. And unfortunately, we come up with all the results, but the role players are different. The role players are not, it's not the university, it's the developers and uh, uh, um, the student themselves. Because if, if somebody can uh, get a cheap, cheaper accommodation and uh, um, compromise their quality of life, we, university cannot have uh, uh, you know, a control over it. Which I think I just took too long. Thank you, Prof. I'm, thank I'm looking at the time. Uh, thank you so much, Prof, for the response that you've given. I hope uh, the gentleman at back, uh, the answer that Prof. Mashalaba has provided, you'll talk to him after during tea time just to get better clarity regarding the issues that you raised. Uh, the last one, we are running out of time. The last one that I'm going to engage, it's uh, computer science students, the group that produced that, 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 that topic was peer-to-peer -to -peer tutoring by Brenda Smith, uh, Kalanchu Fender, and uh, Jocelyn Smith. Uh, regarding Blackboard, what I've seen you've done that there are gamification that I've seen there, virtual reality, 
uh, that was incorporated on the on the presentation. My question is mostly on gamification and the quizzes that you have there. How do you go about uh, making sure that those products that you have, the audience that you are creating this for, they can be able to use them and the feedback that you've received from the students, because I saw that you have that QR code. So I wanted some of us during tea time just to check to get those QR code and check what is available there when you use that QR code. So you're welcome to get a QR code from us during tea time. You can scan it and go through our demo. That's just the student uh, view okay. of our program. There are also lecturer and tutor views. The quizzes will be managed by the tutors or the second third year students who have selected to tutor those two students, and they will be overviewed by the lecturers. They'll ensure the validity of the quizzes and ensure they understand it. I believe that essentially answers the so question. My follow up question the content that you provide on those uh, gamification, just for curiosity, what is entailed in those gamification? So essentially. <laughs> Uh, nice. so, yeah, I, this was just my topic of uh, implementation, so I thought maybe I had a better understanding and better talk to the audience. Um, the initial idea was that based on the ranking on the leaderboard, the students, the top 10 students would receive a prize, maybe a cash prize, prizes from the department. So it motivated them in order to improve their marks and as well as for your question, um, students were incentivized by their department mm -hmm. so it was just first year students and then they were motivated if their marks were good enough to apply to be a tutor the next year so i hope that gets. so it was a motivation for students to work harder so that when they pass they can be tutors yes because okay colleges the tutors will also be paid by the department so there was a lot of incentive for me to Come with you to, to do well. Thank you very much. Uh, without wasting any time, is there any question from the floor regarding their topic before we go for tea break? I believe after this, otherwise I'm going to hand over to Teresa. Uh, there's a question from Nigeria. Hi, um, I just want to ask, was this just a prototype or was it rolled out? So the idea for this project was just the documentation. Um, in third year, there is not enough time in six months to do a complete project. So what was required of us was simply the documentation and the entire process. We ended up going a step further just for this presentation and ended up doing a demo. The demo is not live, it's not um, integrated with a database or hosted. It is simply just the buttons, just so you can get a feel for what the, the interface would have been like. But it was not required of us. We simply went the extra step by doing the, uh, the demo. Thank you very much. Uh, I think from the floor, there's nothing else regarding the question. So, can you chair? Can we join the team? Um, thank you, Mayor Hadi. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would just like to make an announcement on the Popia Act that photos and videos will be taken and through your nod. As a consent, um, we are good. Thank you. Um, so, um, what a stimulating press session. Um, thank you to all the presentations that were said today. Um, yeah, being a student is it, it can be a privilege because I mean you are solution orientated. Um, you are here being productive, 
coming up with solutions that will better our society and you know, not just the university community. Um, but yeah, interesting topics there from how we're navigating um, Blackboard to becoming tutors to the housing challenges and the quality and the costing that student housing is imposing to seeking safe and dignified housing and all the challenges that were set um, by the prof here and also the questions that emanated from the floor um, to cell walls and fungal growth um, which rust that are threatening global food security and economic activities. Um, yeah, I think all of us here are, are seed planters in one way or, or the other. And for us to come up with those pathogens that will go against the wheat rust is um, one of the, the good solutions that we can ever bring. There's a lodge around here that was struggling with um, wheat um, and the questions were, and the sole scientists who can come up with better solutions. So it's great to know that students from the UFS are actually um, coming up with solutions in regards to that challenge. And of course, to the uh, virtual reality computer assembly and building these technical skills through um, this learning um, through VR and how we can wirelessly assemble these components. And as we go to the bio break, um, you may also have your tea just for 10 minutes and we'll be back. Thank you. Yeah, it's like that the whole time. It needs to go well. Let me use this key, but it was. <laughs> Okay. Please the same. I saw it somewhere in the Not here. So, yeah, I'm just going to presentation. Yeah, I think not online. I think. 
confirmation was computer access. No, it is. No, if I talk about it, sorry. I'm going to say, 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 I am not so smiling. Okay. Because it's probably to tell on the land. Because it'll be a multiple Funa Ubanga Tinitin in COVID and then the getting a chart from a London. Yeah. Maragano, I don't know long of advocates. Yep. I think Bunti Baro. Ah, I keep talking station here. We have a right. Oh, it's Billy. Yeah, yeah, I'm on it. I don't Blueberries or bread? I Don't you want to
Ladies and gentlemen, let's settle down. Thank you. Welcome, Rob. Ekare kia obona moshlang ho, moshlamu nene. Mekhabo ya ba soto ui pepe site titana teka lidu tima tole sekari taba imi pepe nene. Maye shwe shwe kasi shwe shwe ase dene mi pala mitle hakalo siya na mare na yona kubo ya buhadi. Fielo aleta te musleme aulo he arwe tuwa na mudia nyewe ima menti pila me haladi itwe pala satana he. Asu tesebo komba wana hae apele heri itwe ke mkono wa tuwa na di kruhulu li di kruhuluana. Aboka ba sengba fitile li hula bu hatla tla macholo mshodi wa mahodimo li mafato ba li pisi ili ka jeno za tilo musoto. Ayy khupulang ili akhaba ka wikhanto ba seo alimso. The twana. Manso manso. Mwana twana za ti. Bare mao ki mobu ntatao ki peo. The twana. Greetings. That was me calling people who are still having tea to come in. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we proceed with the business of the day, we are going to have our keynote address. Thank you. Kindly settle down. Thank you. Our keynote is from U Professor Nombumele Lozondi, or U Prof Mbume, as she prefers to be called. She is a newly appointed Vice Dean for Research and Postgraduate Studies in the Faculty of Humanities here at the University of the Free State in this very campus. She assumed the role on the 1st of March in 2024. Prior to this position, she was the professor at the head of the African Languages Department at the University of Pretoria, she has also worked at the University of Zululand from 2012 until 2017, and at the University of KwaZulu-Natal from 1995 to 2011. She is the National Research Foundation Rated Scholar and has published a corpus of work with high impact journals such as the London Folklore Society, um, Education and Change, the Literature of South African Journal of African Languages and Agenda. Her scholarship converges on African literature, traditional and modern, as well as addressing gender inequality, especially in African patriarchal, patriarchal societies. She has published book chapters with Michigan State University Press in African Performance Arts and Political Acts in 2021, and with Orient Black Swan in Indigenity, Culture and Representation. Her recent monograph, Basabelelani, Why Do They Sing? Uh, is a gender and power in contemporary women's songs in 2020. Here she deconstructs her doctoral thesis uh, which uniquely contributed to unlocking women's agency in rural KwaZulu-Natal. She is a recipient of the prestigious and highly competitive Fulbright South African Research Scholar Program. While her host, the university was the Ohio State University, the program provided her with an opportunity to engage with a few universities in the US where she either de she delivered keynote addresses or served as a guest speaker or guest lecturer. She is a lead editor for the 2023 SE publication, Teta Sizwe, the contemporary South African debates on African languages and the politics of gender and sexualities. The book launch took place here in Bloemfontein campus at the University of the Free State on the 30th of 
January in 2024. Probe Zondi looks forward to engaging with different departments in the faculty as well as identifying a niche area of research with other faculties. She would like to see students being part of the university's vision 130, engaged with cutting edge research that will be recognized nationally and internationally while becoming socially responsible citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, as we welcome Professor Mpume. Thank you, Program Director, <clears throat> for the introduction. It was so generous of you, kind of you, to kind of cover as much of me as possible. Given that I have uh, 10 minutes to give this talk, may I acknowledge you all uh, in your various positions and uh, portfolios Therefore, please allow me to say Dumelang, Dumelang, Oyemore, Good Morning, Tanbonan. Be that as it may, I greet in a special way uh, our undergraduate and honor students as uh, they deserve a special mention on this important day when they celebrate and learn more about research. It's an honor to be invited to give some words of encouragement and motivation just a little over a month since I joined this vibrant community. This is the first task that I've been asked to perform and it speaks to what is close to my heart or to what is at the center of my heart, you, the students. When I was interviewed for my position, I highlighted the need for students to be at the center of discussions that aim to take the university to greater heights and their participation has been considered important and inevitable for higher education governance. Thus, the saying, Inkunzi isematolin, the bull is among the calves, the bull as tessen de calves, poho ehara manamani, is apt as it highlights the importance of young people in nation building. I believe that students deserve to be cared for in a holistic manner so that they can also add value to society and communities from which they come. You are students now, but you are also the future of the university as well as that of the country at large, South Africa needs you. That is why it is important that you are natured in such an environment. My academic uh, trajectory was not a smooth sailing journey as I had to navigate a lot of situations on my own since we're not afforded opportunities such as the one you have. For example, I was never exposed to a research seminar day. Consider yourselves fortunate to be at an institution that cares about students. And of course, you are important as you rightly know that without students, there is no university. The evidence of the significance of your position within the university is encapsulated in the brilliant way 
Vision 130 articulates how it aspires to foster dynamic, diverse, and safe student living and learning environment. Furthermore, and by extension, its mission is committed to provide excellent living for holistic student development. The university desires to become a research-led and student-centered place that contributes to developing uh, and the development and social justice through production of globally competitive graduates and knowledge. That's not me saying that, but it's according to uh, Vision 130. You are the kind of students to which this vision speaks. However, such hopes, dreams, yearnings, and expectations will not be met unless the university puts in place systems that uh, support student growth. I'm sure you will agree with me that this event is one of the initiatives demonstrating that you are the university, you are at the university that cares about students. On this occasion, I wish to speak briefly to one of many aspects of research that you need to be aware of as you venture into the research space. That is research integrity and ethics. These are principles that guide research designs and practices. I cannot emphasize this enough. In this is we say, that means a tree is bent while it is still wet. This means that wisdom and behavioral influences are instilled when a person is still young. As researchers in the making and as people who are creating knowledge that advances societal and knowledge impact, you need to understand research ethics and integrity as you continue to tread in this path. This begins with your everyday writing of assignments, short research papers, and classroom presentations. You acknowledge sources from which information you use come. I want you to think about that. How honest are you with referencing and or citing sources that you use in your work? You get away with uh, such issues by turning to paraphrasing someone's work. Are you aware that uh, paraphrasing also requires acknowledgement? Have you ever taken some time to think about why, for example, plagiarism is an unethical practice? Even worse, you understand that cheating the systems or manipul manipulating it to your favor is unethical. Seeing students working with uh, the plagiarism tools, so you turn it in and stuff, taking it from 60% to uh, 2% uh, when uh, they haven't changed anything about uh, what they are putting. So you are the generation of technology, but how do we think about that? Is that correct? You assist a friend by giving him or her your work, which you already submitted elsewhere. These are just some of the questions that you should always be asking yourselves. Avoiding these malpractices should be second nature to you. And you are very lucky that uh, you are at the transitioning stage of your academic career. And it is really important that 
these are instilled in you. It might be something that we are already doing, I'm sure, but it's something that we also need to be very serious about and to always think about. I wish to highlight that regardless of what type of research we are working on, be it desktop, human, or whatever research, cutting corners will take you nowhere. Instead, it has the potential to cause high risk in your study. In fact, disregarding ethical procedures when conducting research could land you in hot water or maybe even in hot soup, whichever is best for you, <laughs> such as facing a lawsuit. In most cases, when ethical and considerations are overlooked. The victims are members of vulnerable and or marginalized groups. Some organizations have committed to educate researchers about the rights and the wrongs of caring for research. That is why, for example, at the seventh World Conference on Research Integrity, whose theme was fostering research integrity in an unequal world, and which was held in Cape Town in 2022. The Cape Town Statement on Fairness, Equity, and Diversity in Research was adopted. The statement provides 20 recommendations. These uh, recommendations or suggestions advocate for, and I quote, fair practice from conception to implementation of research and at all involved stakeholders to fairness, equity, and diversity in research, unquote. The recommendations touch on issues of diversity, inclusivity, mutual respect, shared accountability, indigenous knowledge recognition, and epistemic justice. The last component is very important as it speaks to ensuring that the value of knowledge is not based on biases related to gender, race, ethnicity, culture, religion, socioeconomic status, etc., etc. And that's not me who says that, but it's in horn. So I'm trying to walk the talk. Those who take up research integrity issues seriously do so to prevent repetition of unethical behaviors that took place in the past in some parts of the world, especially where harmful experiments were conducted on humans. Again, these research participants would be people from the margins. The American abuses during the project MK Ultra and the Tuskegee experiments are examples of research that was conducted without consent from participants. And they were sensitive uh, studies on every level. Sadly, in the second case, Patients were not offered treatment even after the results had been received. So what then was the point of the experiments in the first place? In closing, I wish you well as you showcase the innovative research and projects that you have been working on in your various faculties. I also hope that as you celebrate the winners, and you consider yourself all winners. The fact that you are here, you are already a winner. You also must be on the lookout for possible research niche areas that might uh, present opportunities for multidisciplinary collaboration and in that way, break down a silo mentality. May I also emphasize that you should consider yourself privileged to be afforded 
occasions such as these, where your academic and research acumen will be sharpened and prepare you for masters and later run PhD in your respective faculties. As I have indicated, my life was never easy. I always wonder where I would be if I had received such attention as we are getting. Who knows? Perhaps I would be the country's president and doing things differently from how I watch on the sidelines. Perhaps the corruption game playing in political spheres, especially that of enriching uh, themselves and amassing wealth at the expense of taxpayers' hard-earned monies would not be the order of the day. Maybe our country would be known for emulating values such as social justice, as it is pertinent in the South African context, when we consider uh, historical injustices that we have experienced due to the triple challenge of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. Perhaps excellence, impact, accountability, care, and sustainability would be values for which our country would genuinely be known and respected. And these are the values espoused in our university's uh, vision 130 and encapsulate the essence of the type of student that the university aspires to produce. Well, the truth of the matter is that I'm not a president, am I? But guess what? I'm pleased because you are that student whose interest we have at heart. The student who will stand out and emulate the university's values. I believe you are that student. Please remember to be considerate and be ethical in all your research undertakings. I thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Okay. As we give Prof a round of applause. Although it sounded like something else. Anyway, did you know that the best assignment competition was inaugurated in 2019 to showcase the quality of work produced by the students of the University of the Free State? With only two assignments received from humanities and natural and agricultural sciences, which were showcased on the university website. The library and information service started seeing a greater number of submissions from the faculties and uh, eventually leading to the establishment of this seminar, which was aimed at determining the skills and the competencies gained from the library and information research skills and training. So as we move right along, I would like to introduce Mr. Lee Goliath, who is the faculty librarian of humanities. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Director. Um, it's so unfortunate that the time sort of catching up with us because I wanted to make this session so interesting that we're gonna not that the previous ones weren't, but uh, we people we can really chill and just relax a little bit. It feels like some lecture we're sitting in here. We're here to celebrate students' good work today. 
you uh, celebrate the uh, academics, hard work, and the support I give to our students, which can qualify to present. But as Prof mentioned earlier on, all submissions are actually winners. All submissions are were the best. We just had to unfortunately select who can, can, can come and present. And obviously from the humanities, I'm always very proud. Um, as mentioned that, uh, the, as the program facilitator mentioned, that it started off with a with uh, an assignment from the uh, from the humanities and one of the other faculties. But without any further ado, I'd like to also welcome our academics that are here today, specifically to support um, their students from the humanities. Uh, Dr. Josh Miller, very welcome and thank you. Um, Mr. Josie Rekwani, very welcome and thank you. And Prof. Theo Nietlin, Thank you very much and very welcome to come and support your students' um, presentations. Without any further ado, our first um, presenter will be presenting online. Uh, there will be a recording played. He is online. Mr. Siddiqui, we acknowledge you and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule in Gauteng to come and honor um, this invitation. And thereafter, we will then speak to our next pre presenters. We'd like to ask um, Ms. Davidson and Ms. Smith to start mentally preparing themselves for their sessions. Um, and thank you very much. Let's give Mr. Siddiqui online a hand.
Thank you very much, Mr. Siddiqui. Uh, Dr. Joyce, I'm so sorry I forgot to invite you to come and sit in the front. Or could you maybe just stand up so everybody could see who you are? Dr. Joyce is in the presence, Mr. Siddiqui, hearing me online. And he will be with us here for the session when we when we start asking questions or trying to elaborate on this topic from a sociology point of view. Um, I just need to clarify this morning we also heard a student indicating that they are master students and we also heard now that Siddiqui is a master student. The students when they submitted the assignments they submitted it as honor students so they currently busy with their master students so it is even so more encouraging because we'll hear some of the presenters today that submitted undergraduate on a third or fourth year level will be coming to tell you they are honor students now. So what does that say to you? that these type of platforms of uh, activities that the, the, the library uh, motivates and the collaboration with the academics eventually lead to, and I know the previous year as well, all the participants that I know of in the humanities eventually went on to study on, on another postgraduate level. So if they were very really honest, they went on to masters and all the undergraduates that were uh, presenting moved on to 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 honors level so this is really adding value specifically to the research and uh, the research and output of the university of the Bristol. state um without any further ado i'd like to invite prof neo theater with the moral support and please come and sit in front of our vision and um uh, if you don't mind and then i'm gonna ask miss davidson to join us in the front. So now you'll have less, you'll have less anxiety knowing properly sitting there and supporting you. Okay, let's give another round of applause. The Davidson topic is revisiting the political risk in South Africa in 2023. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Amanda Davidson, and I'm here today to give you a brief presentation about political risk analysis in South Africa 2023. As we all know, South Africa is a diverse and driving nation with a rich history and culture. However, political risk have impacted its economic and social stability, requiring for a new evaluation of pertinent indicators. Ladies and gentlemen, this was recent when the Minister of Finance saying ESCOM crime key disruptors to South African case investment. The point is that these are the disruptors to our South African cases. On the basis of that, I had to do an analysis figuring out whether South Africa is a high risk, medium risk, or low case risk, or low case risk. The aim of the study was to do a fresh analysis of four relevant variables in South African context. So in today's presentation, we'll be looking at uh, what is political risk and focusing on these four variables in South African context, namely administrative incompetence, safety and security, micro and political economic, and lastly, we have labor law. What is political risk analysis? Political risk analysis is a multifaceted and complex, complex, crossing several disciplines. It is commonly used it is commonly used as a, it is commonly defined as a risk of financial or other losses due to political issues, such as government actions, instability, and social political upheaval. In political science, political risk contains the use of power and the harm it causes to individuals and groups, as well as non-state actors and the international order. The term political risk was given as an element of states to of element of states that were at risk, explaining why these governments were in debt, not solely because of economic problems. Political risk, however, ladies and gentlemen, impacted uh, can impact uh, investment decisions, supply chain management, and market entrance strategies, making it crucial for businesses investors, government, and to consider when making this decision. 
administrator, administration and compensates. Administration and compensates has been a problem in South African South African government affecting it, affecting the country's economy, social services, and political stability. The lack of performance at the local government is a clear sign of weak governance, leading to the inconsistence of service deliveries and worsening the and worsening the audit results. It is impossible to overstate the inconsistent. It, it is impossible to overstate the inconsistent of nature of service delivery. Therefore, administrate. Therefore, administrative incompetence remains a significant political danger in South African context, with the situation deterring over time. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our second variable, which is safety and security. South Africa is dealing with a high crime rate, crimes such as violence, murder. Uh, theft and rape, leading to the sense of insecurity among the public. Violent crimes, such as violent crimes and gender-based violence, have resulted in the widespread social unrest, protest, and strikes, posing a hazard to the investors. Furthermore, the rising crime or the rising crime rate and safety concerns, making it challenging for the policies to maintain law and order in South Africa, which affects the confidence of the investors. Micropolitical and economic. South Africa has undergo a turbulent economic and social and political climate with the high rates of unemployment, inequality and corruption. Leadership and changes, leadership changes and policy uncertainty have delayed the intentional economic measures threatening the country's stability and potential growth. Furthermore, corruption inhibits economic growth and development, deterring competition and discouraging, discouraging investment in the country. However, above all, South Africa still offers a good investment opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move to our last available, which is labor policy. The government and the labor unions the private sectors have a contentious uh, relationship due to the intensive and progressive labor in the country. Labor policies have significant influence on the, econ on the country's economic development and stability, making it an important expert for investors and enterprises to consider. Furthermore, the, continu the continuous disagreement about labor policies and the influence of labor unions on economic activities poses a political risk for businesses in South Africa. Not much has been changed about the previous analysis. South Africa's situation has worsened, increasing political danger in the country. The study was the study examined administration in competence, safety and security concerns, and political and micro political economic conditions, as well as labor policies and significant risk at South African as our indicators. Um, as I've mentioned before, South Africa has a potential to become greater, but it is investor, it is the investors' uh, duty to do a research before making any investment decisions in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Davidson. Thank you very much, Pro. You. I was hoping the, the, the presentation continued because I became so indulged and I started thinking of what you're talking about now, how relevant it is to the the election year and then I was trying to understand the sociological part of our previous um, presenter who was talking about the climate change and he specifically um, related to some of if we can call them the, the wrongdoers the, he referred to BB and how that impacted and looking at it all politically and as much as it's a need I was trying to bring these two topics together and thinking, but one does affect the other. But I think there will be questions earlier, later on. But how relevant this topic now, especially in an election year? 
I'm going to ask Mr. Joseph Rekwani to please join us in the brunt, and he is really one that's so supportive of this program, always involved, always submit so many, and uh, he's got so much to offer. And we're going to ask Ms. Smith and her team, because they are a group, uh, they'll also um, give us the name of the other group members, but please join us as we give them a hand. And they are from the Department of Anthropology. So we had, please join us. We had um, sociology, uh, we had political science, and now we have anthropology. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give the ladies another hand. Good afternoon, no, morning, no. Um, my name is Mia Smith, and this is Dr. Kile Kanini. Um, we are now honor students in anthropology. I'll dive just in. <laughs> um, so, our, our presentation is about the women's and role of the University of Kingston States. Um, the outline of this will be uh, the challenge, the historical policy legacy, deep mapping of how we think into uh, how we assessed it, the law regarding itself, key findings, conclusion, and recommendations. In the shadow courtyard made by the backs of the northern part of the main building, the West Block and the Chemistry Building, lies the University of the Free States Women's Memorial. With a goal to recreate and create spaces on campus um, that are inclusive of various social and cultural factors, as well as striving to achieve social justice via these spaces, we use various legislations and plans to provide perspective, such as the South African National Development Plan. The question of how the politics of exclusion and dehumanization challenge these goals are also assessed. Necessary to assess spaces is to look at the consequences of South Africa's colonial and apartheid history and the, con um, the legislations made during those years set the table for continuous implications of the country's social cohesion. We look at three legislations that enact the politics of exclusion and dehumanization. The Nets of Land Act of 1913, the Group Acts Areas Act of 1950 during the apartheid government, the National Monument Act of 28 of 1969. The Native Land Act was one of the first legal steps towards the beginning of um, towards the beginning of apartheid in South, South Africa. With the stripping of ownership of land from Black people, also came the stripping of their food source, houses, and family homes. During the apartheid, the Group Areas Act further refined the government's goal for complete segregation. This was achieved by moving into urban areas and implementing strict ethnic borders of who is allowed when and where. The National Monument Act of 1969, although not problematic on its own, was used to enable these other acts with, and was used in favour of the oppressor, seeming to put the exotic and putting performance of history rather than true history at the forefront. Moving on with spaces, uh, with the historical spatial background, it can be said that there are, is a very distinct relationship between South African spatial landscapes and racial stratification. A further hierarchy of differentiating spaces is by saying that spaces can be gendered, which of course can also perpetuate exclusion. Thus, drawing from the experiences of racialized and gender spaces, there is a complex relationship between the collective memory, material realities of social economic split, uh, disparity, and the structural legacies of apartheid. In this relationship, recognition and representation is what strived for in order to tackle the always arising structural violence and cultural discontent. Um, hi, as mentioned, I am Tandegi Leguneni. I am going to proceed with the key findings. So for the key findings, uh, sorry, for the deep mapping. <laughs> Excuse me. So for the research process, we followed a qualitative research paradigm. This was the most appropriate approach to receiving an in-depth understanding and wider perspective of the current student body's perception and lived experiences of the space. We examined space ontologically and the focus was the Women's Memorial. For our methodology, we had an in-situ research approach with the memorial space as our research field. Walking ethnography brought a nuanced outlook on the space, drawing in an insider-outsider dual position while conducting semi-structured interviews. We engaged in participant observation, immersed in the space while noting our observations. This embodied experience of the space brought central scholarship to the center of the ethnographic process. 
And by way of the photo story, we understood the memorial through sight. Looking, uh, locating our positionality and utilizing flexibility meant being conscious of our social identity as women, asking about the women's memorial. And allowing ourselves to be reflexive during observation, we were able to identify factors that may have informed the outcomes of the observations. We used the thematic analysis for the data gathered through full notes and consented uh, recordings. So looking at the UFS integrated transformation plan in line with the Vision 130 and focusing on the important themes of inclusivity, inclusivity diversity and equitability whilst checking the avail availability of the sense of inclusion and common purpose. Further unpacking and inquiring upon the feminist spatial theory and Lefebvre's spatial production, the feminist spatial theory speaks of remembering and memory, how memorials in space are entangled with time. By having collective memory, meaning is given to spaces and that humanizes and plays a part in human interaction. So Lefebvre's spatial uh, production, the conceptualization of space is the primary locus of lived experiences and understanding space uh, through an approach that moves space from the abstract to the foundation of engagement with our history. Looking at the connections of the tribe and how space is conceived, perceived and lived from Lefebvre's perspective, space can now be defined as organic, fluid and alive rather than dead, life, lifeless, um, a dead lifeless okay. entity or object. On 9 August 2011, the national, uh, the on National Women's Day in 2011, the Women's Memorial was unveiled with the UFA's new logo to stand on. Professor Juki Hay, at the forefront of the erection of the memorial, saw it as a way to celebrate the historical struggle and sacrifices of all South African women, especially those that fought against exclusion through sexism and racism. The vision of the memorial is to be able to represent unity. This unity is built through the continuous process of understanding, knowledge building and faith. Professor Hayes sees these characteristics that should be pursued by the UFA's women, but also all other students, so that a sustainable and prosperous, prosperous future can be achieved. The memorial in the space around it was designed by architect Siegfried Kussel, who designed the garden with the vision of it being an active learning space. The vision that we had for the memorial garden is what is needed when including open spaces in the plans for inclusion and sustainability. Yet, as will also be discussed in more detail later, the memorial has not yet achieved this with only its presence, as almost no one knows that it is a memorial, neither a women's memorial. Thus, with the meaning loss, so also is the potential for its aid in the future. The gender bias in academia and, it his and its history is definitely not unheard of, rather used as a co cornerstone in the arguments and example of sexism and exclusion. Although have, there has been a definite rise to, in statistics, in statistics in, of female scholars, history and generational mindsets have yet to be forgotten. Thus, the Women's Memorial stands as the physical representation of this long and ongoing history, having the potential to play an integral part in forming a more cohesive collective memory of the campus. When finding the connection between the past and present, the monument becomes part of the space that can define oneself, dancing at it with the knowledge of what it stands for, already the links between the different points of history is made, also with each individual's unique perception of it. So now the key findings. <laughs> so for the key findings, we considered and uh, we considered and found interesting the differences in how males and females res would respond to our questions. We focused on the recurring theme of visibility, spatial practice, and lived experiences. We found that the space is used and seen by many daily, but the meaning is unknown or vague, and that it is either used as a lunch spot or smoking area. That did not invoke any kind of emotion or meaning. One of our informants responded that they use, they just use the space for shade and lunch, and they like that it's just quiet. The conclusion before the recommendations was that in line with the spatial practice, we saw that the memorial can act as a foot in the door to wider conversation about spaces in order to reclaim the original vision that was had for it being an active learning space. The open space, how it can also be seen as an open, how open spaces can be viewed and perceived on campus. 
in line with the National Heritage Act of 25 and 1999, it is clear that heritage has the potential to define cultural identity and how the Women's Memorial can as an integral part in this as with the heritage of the campus. The recognition and knowledge of how women are seen through this memorial can also not be seen, but should be seen. Moving on with the recommendations uh, to move from object centrism to functionalism, whilst recognizing the garden for its cultural symbolic significance in line with the National Heritage Resources Act 25, 1999, we recommend that curriculum design and practices extend the conversation beyond the classroom and harness text and open university spaces to breathe life into the memorial. For visibility, there, could, there should be a signpost on the campus walkway direct into the memorial and a QR code with a brief description of the memorial for engagement purposes. Thank you. I don't know much of this in Zimanki, or much of the rethinking spaces, but can we give them another hand? Now, now forgive me, but I'm also involved with student affairs, and when I listen to our student presenting like this, I'm like, wow, um, you all really do, did well. I gave a different perspective on spaces for that matter. And I'm going to ask you guys, I don't know when you'll get to your PhD level, that you'll do a study on the spaces in the library, maybe. And put it into perspective so that we can start appreciating it like we appreciate that space. And yes, we pass that space, but we never think of its significance. And many other spaces, even the spaces in your in your direct environment at home, you know, the spaces you move in, and you start looking at it differently. Thank you so so much, um, colleagues. I'm sure you guys have got so people who are writing; they were asking questions. But I'm going to ask um, that. Um, we take a few questions for for the sessions. Can we do it per topic, or can we go general because our academics are here and our presenters are here? But we have a, a, a one a Mr. Sadiq is online. Um, but I know we want to unpack these topics now. I mean, I got so many questions, but I'm actually facilitating, so I can't ask all these questions. Um, can we, with a show of hands, get? Uh, a few questions. Can we start with addressing climate change cooperations by uh, Mr. Siddiqui? And we have Dr. Dr. Josh with us, and we address uh, the topic. Are there any questions we can that you would like to ask, or clarification that you would like to seek, or an opinion um, that you would like to give towards that topic? Are there any? Um, can we have a roaming mic at the back? Um, for our director, welcome, Ms. Jeanette Molopiani. Can can we give Ms. Molopiani a hand? Thank you for joining us. She's so humble. She just speaking. She didn't want anybody to see her. It's so privilege having you in our midst. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I want to congratulate our students and, and thank the academics for this amazing work. And I just want to comment. And I'm saying this work is getting so much international views. This work is viewed a million times throughout the world, especially in, 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 in America and in, 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 in Europe and in Asia. So we don't know the significance. Maybe sometimes if we knew who were really viewing this work, we could maybe have a, a, a unanimous a online you know, questionnaire. So I just want to say you really are putting the university on the map and continue doing this amazing way because it is contributing towards resolving societal issues. And I really want to commend you highly for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our IT team, is there any questions online? Um, on the specific first topic before I ask my question. Is there another hand? There's another hand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duplessis. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I think it's a very important topical issues that, that has been addressed. 
uh, especially in terms of climate change, because ultimately I look at climate change, you know, you look at from both the micro level of analysis, you can look at meso or on a macro level of analysis, especially if you look at uh, these multinational corporations. But the example that was used by, by BP, uh, British Petroleum, and, and trying to go green. Uh, ultimately, I, I, I asked the question, and then if you look at climate change in relations with sovereignty and having some form of a universal policies, how do you address those issues that we know that climate change is not only a problem in one particularity? You can look at climate change where these multinational corporations are mainly based in developing countries vis-a-vis -vis developed countries and, and understanding uh, what is the policies in these developing co developed countries, for example, in Europe, Western Europe or America, and the implications where we do not have these strong uh, policies specifically in these developing countries or developing countries. How do you then deal with that particular disjunction in terms of policies in keeping these guys accountable uh, in terms of climate change? Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Josh just to to give us a response on that. If Sadiki is online and if we can hear him, um, can he maybe respond? Can we get the mic to Dr. Josh? Maybe just in a summary, uh, because I picked up just Changsa and policies and how it affects. And thank you for the question, Mr. Dr. C. Thank you. Um, Yes, thanks very much. And I, I actually just want to take a moment to say thank you to all of the presenters because I, I thought the presentations were really excellent. Um, in response to the question in terms of uh, this this issue around sovereignty and the kind of location in which some of these things happen versus the global nature of climate change, I think the key thing there is is one multilateral agreements have to take place. So things through the UN and, and these sorts of uh, bodies are absolutely necessary. But another part of it is that a lot of the harms that uh, Molala mentioned in the presentation, things like the destruction of indigenous people's lands, things like the murder of uh, climate change activists, assassinations and these sorts of things take place in particular localities. Um, and so the difficulty there is is building um, international accountability mechanisms. And so I think probably our colleagues in law have something to contribute on that in particular. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, these these are very difficult issues to resolve transnationally, especially when some of these larger uh, climate polluters are busy essentially bribing governments to not have the kinds of policies that we need. Um, and I think for that, the only thing that is is necessary is uh, action from below to hold governments accountable and and ensure that they do in fact pass laws that protect environmental resources and and people. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm sure we are becoming so politically educated today. Thank you for those those responses. Um, are there any questions uh, related to, and I know this can now become a whole discussion on Ms. Davidson's topic, where she spoke about the political risk in South Africa in 2023. A very interesting topic. Are there any questions, any comments, any opinions? Okay. We have, uh, can we have the mic here again uh, to soon to be Dr. Duplessis? I'm oh, sorry for asking so many questions, but I like questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I like political science. I actually love political science. And I think it was a very, very important presentation. And I think it's it's one that we need to take uh, uh, attention uh, or, or, or take cognizance of. But if you look at specifically, I just want to, to look at uh, the presentation because if you look at the various variables that was used uh, in the analysis, and, and I think about the interview by Andre Beretis, uh, he's now in exile, who said that, that, that the honest people was on a way because they want to do the job. Uh, and it has implications in political risk analysis. So the question is then, how do you address the issue? If you look specifically at that particular interview in terms of the deep state, you know, we have these mafia contractors, we have a deep state that the state do not exist on a superficial level, but within the state, in the deeper or the shadow state. 
uh, what do you do then with that, that that actually you know uh actually increase that that sometimes they want to have you know what good governance better governance but you find that within the deep state there are people within these state institutions that actually destroy this to what extent then does the presentation then acknowledge all uh, at least the deep state in in, in in creating greater risk in, in south africa at least at least from political risk perspective thank you very much Thank you. Um, Ms. Levinson would like to respond to that. Your hand is noted, Mr. Israel. Or well, would Prof. Nierling like to come in? I see she's showing. She, she's really, she's confident with Prof. Nierling being around. Thank you, Prof. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, the fact is, what we do at the third year level, what I do is I usually work with no less than 14 variables, which they developed at the University of Johannesburg. and. Um, giving that to my students. The poor student at, uh, at third year level only has the opportunity to look at four of them. So um, they need to select four, and that's exactly what she did. Now, when I um, present these uh, 14 variables to my students, I usually take three weeks to discuss all of them. And then you can actually uh, go into everything that is of relevance. Uh, but she had 10 minutes. And she she just uh, well she just basically had to tell you what she did, uh, but that's that obviously is something of of, of great relevance. Uh, I often get the opportunity to speak to audiences, and I always say to them, well, the banking industry, the mining industry, uh, churches. I I go around; they invite me all the time, and I usually say to them, okay, but. I'm gonna. You you need to give me an hour and a half to go at least through uh, some of the most important things. So you can talk for a day about these sort of things. And she obviously didn't have the opportunity. Uh, she just uh, touched on that very briefly, and I think she did well. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we're going to of elections. Um, Dr. Sugulai, we recognize your presence. Thank you for being here. Um, is there any other questions, comments? Is, uh, Mr. Israel, there was a question from you. More of a comment. If we can just give Mr. Israel a mic, please. Uh, good, uh, good morning. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And uh, well done to uh, the pre uh, brilliant presentation. Uh, mine is more of a comment on the last presenters, uh, the anthropology department. Uh, surprisingly, this morning I was reading, you know, uh, an article on place and presence, and precisely that's what they touched on. So, just commenting on this uh, through their presentation and also through my reading, it's just us to think as a university community of the impact of the place and the impact that it has on students. Uh, it can be an enabler or a, a source of constraint. Just looking at, you know. Our for 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 us who are who've got who are able to move around with our feet, uh, the place is one can can move around. But some other places where a person who's who's got a physical disability, you know, cannot necessarily access. So just for us to think about the impact of place and what it symbolizes and what whether it's an enabler or a constraint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. And yes, it does make one thing deeper that we have many spaces, but not always accessible. Um, and thank you for alerting to that, because I never noticed that I passed there a lot going to, to some of the departments. Are there any questions with regard to the last presentation? I know it stole everybody's minds. Everybody just needs wants to get out here to go take new pics there at that uh, monument. I never knew they called it the Women's Monument. I always just look at it as an artwork. Any questions or comments towards that? It was done so well that we might not even want to question. We would all like us to have a presentation after the, the work. Any question? Yes, Doc. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, thank you. I'm not going to ask any question towards what you were suggesting, <laughs> Brother Lee, but I just want to say, to commend all the lecturers and all the students 
specifically because as a university, we're talking about Vision 130. And what we are doing with this, uh, this uh, research seminar is to promote, you know, to inculcate the culture of research while still at, at, at undergraduate level. So this is really uh, something that we need to take into consideration and really do it even better than the way we are doing it now. Because we were talking yesterday, Israel, to remember, as we write our reports, we need to see how much of our students are going into master's and doctoral studies. And if we do not start to inculcate this culture now, we will not get many from our universities. And we need to make sure that we really grow our own timber from our own first year second and, and see them going into the master's and doctoral studies. So I just want to commend our lecturers for the good work that they're doing. Thank you, Dr. There was another hand. Um, uh, there's a, the lady with the stripe and then a view here at the back. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I enjoyed the presentation very much and there's still questions in my head that I'm trying to properly articulate. And we just asked, I wanted to ask if maybe afterwards there would be space to ask questions that we weren't able to ask in the beginning. Okay, why are we getting the mic to the next question? I want to believe our presenters are still going to be around. They're going to be having lunch with us. Um, and then I'm sure we'll be able to engage on that. Maybe you just try to ask the questions in front of everybody. But make a voice note, make a voice note. Don't forget that question. Okay. Can we, Fifi? Um, my question is towards um, the Women's Memorial is something that you mentioned in your presentation about people not acknowledging the spaces for what they're actually supposed to be known for. And I found that to be very worrying. So then my question then says that who is responsible for that? Um, because I feel like these places, these spaces, as you mentioned, are losing their historical references if then people have no regard for them. Thank you. Our presenter would like to, to respond personally. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't think it should be a question of pointing fingers of who is responsible for such a thing because it is, again, it's an open space, so it can be interpreted as is. Um, a big play on what we also touched on in the original assignments is the, um, not a big part, but a part is the architecture and consequently also the aesthetic of the space. Um, one of the reasons why I believe it's not seen as clearly as a Women's Memorial is because the writing, there is writing on the back side. It says the Big Women's Women's Women Memorial, um, but it's on the back side and no one sees it, no one actually looks at it. Um, at the around it, if you go look again, you'll see there are spaces for um, different species of plants to grow, and each has its meaning, but only the scientific name of the plant is growing there. Um, but each has its meaning in a way of saying it's a woman's, you know, um, something to do with women's history. Um, so it, is, it can be troubling, <laughs> it depends on what mindset you are. Um, but I believe that once it has been clearly made with a signpost or a QR code as was in the recommendations. I think it goes, it will slowly start to become um, interpreted as a space where you, you refer to it as a memorial. You don't just walk past it and say, so if I'm here up behind the main building, you say I'm at the women's memorial. So it's a slow, it's a slow process. Um, and once more about it will be spread rather than just just on Women's Day, which is a holiday so no one's here. Um, it will be well known, but it's no, we don't want to point fingers. It's just, it is what it is. <laughs> Thank you so much for that that uh, response. Mr. Joe also wants to um, add to that response. Thank you so much. So I'm going to point fingers. <laughs> I won't point fingers. Such a good thinker. Space at the University of the Free State and other institutions are intellectually dead because our lecturers are not intentional about harnessing the text that exists in space. 
to stretch their classroom practices into open spaces. So you cannot expect a student to understand that there is actually an opportunity in open space, not in classroom spaces. They're quick at the conferences at the CTL to say, I am busy with the attribute interdisciplinary. How can you even think there's interdisciplinary in a classroom of political science, in a classroom of anthropology? It is interdisciplinary because there are multiple disciplines that intersect, that engage and encounter at an open space. So the, the Women's Memorial and other spaces of significance are ontologies of teaching domains that lecturers should be intentional about incorporating that in their curriculum and that their pedagogical practice. So I'm pointing fingers. Otherwise, they going to continuously become proxies for argument. The, the student will use those open spaces to say, if you don't, if Izaka does not Izaka, we will bring down the women's memorial. Or alternate, the women's memorial will only become alive during the month of, of women. What, what, what are lecturers doing? So I am pointing fingers because classroom spaces are not actually enough. When students walk out of classrooms should be able to understand that what we've just been introduced to has a political kind of implication as far as conversations as of class is concerned. Yo. <laughs> Will we recording? I need that. I need that. I am so challenged. But we are recording the session. Mr. Joe, you always challenge me, but yes, it makes us think further. There is another comment question that's becoming interesting now. Thank you. Hello. Um, sadly, I wrote a whole PhD on urban open spaces, and I still cannot answer uh, these questions that have been posed today um, regarding the, the, the spaces. But uh, my comment regarding uh, that last presentation is that uh, I, I do think from indigenous, uh, say, knowledge systems or um, I would say African culture, we do have these uh, uh, gender spaces or gender-based spaces. What I would like to maybe propose is that uh, uh, maybe the, the, the location of the, of the of the memorial itself should be linked to women's type of land use activities, whatever those uh, may be, so that um, it, it's sort of integrated uh, to the people that actually uh, need it the most. Um, I, I'll give an example with regards to just maybe some Kosa cultural practices. Um, you, you often find uh, women separated from men um, and doing whatever they, that they are doing. If we can find those uh, land uses that are only obviously for women, we can integrate such uh, um, information in terms of spacing. Where do you actually locate those things within the campus? And then uh, I wanted to have a, a Maybe just a comment uh, on the uh, on the two presentations, but a combined comment. Who sets the political agenda for for these things? Um, even for climate change, for example. Uh, I'm saying this thing because if I've got, I'm not saying we do have uh, 30 years or 50 years worth of maybe coal or, or non-renewable resources that we haven't used. And then somebody who has depleted the earth set up an agenda um, to say, you should stop using what you have and use the technology that you don't have, but they have the technology. Because over time, as their stocks or resources are dwindling, a person then uh, um, uh, changes the way of doing things, or maybe you adapt. So they've already adapted to that. Um, and they're coming up with obviously new technologies. And we might not necessarily have them. And I've got all these resources. Who sets the agenda for this particular discussion? It's just something that we need to really look at. Thank you very much, Prof. 
I'm going to close the questions and my opinions for, for time purposes. And what Prof was mentioning now, on my way home yesterday, I was listening to a, a radio talk show. Well, not a talk show, it's actually on the news. That China is producing, or overproducing, um, what do they call it? Uh, sun panels, sun panels, sun uh, panels. Solar panels, they're overproducing. So much so that they don't know what to do with it anymore. That in places like Sweden and places in the UK, they're using these solar panels now for fences because there's just too many. And what Prof just mentioned about resources and not having or what we have or go get what, what, what we don't have. If we had those solar panels in South Africa, we could have helped with a lot of the informal settlements and the building of it until we get to the RDP houses and just imagine the, the amount of energy that we could have saved. But they're not rooting it to South Africa. Unfortunately, we're still paying a lot of money for solar panels. Yeah, obviously, we all want to go because we're feeding it the most at the load shedding. Um, but having resources and having to get resources, and I hope that we'll really have this overflow of too many uh, solar panels in South Africa and we can really, really use it. But colleagues, thank you once again for the active participation in this specific session. The presenters and um, um, academics will be around. Dr. Josh did mention he has another commitment a bit later, but you've got his name is, uh, and, and I'm sure he won't mind us giving his email out if you've got more questions and to the presenters. But we are really proud of the, both first sessions and the presenters. Thank you once again. Thank you, Mr. Goliath. Again, interesting session. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Diki, on addressing those issues around climate change and the corporations and business and the higher percentage of business um, that it has on global pollution throughout the many industrial revolutions that we've had. Um, and they say, um, Guy McPherson says, if you think that um, the environment is less important than the economy, then try holding your breath while counting your money. And uh, Davidson, uh, for revisiting the political risks in South Africa um, here in 2023 and the many government actions and the instability that it, it brings. And it is said again that any country that is not politically stable so will be its economy. And of course, the spaces um, defined by the Living uh, Women's Memorial. It reminded me of the plastic, um, pink plastic, that was part of the Free Fears back in 2014, where they covered all the statues um, in various open spaces um, in town, um, at the memorials um, um, <laughs> site. And the idea was that behind every male statue that you have, behind all this history that we have that is patriarchal by its nature, there was a woman involved. So they dressed all those statues in pink. Yeah, public art. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move right along to the fourth session, I'd like to call on our chair, Mr. Matla Amalepa, um, focusing on education. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Program Director, for the introduction. I'm going to proceed. I will be sharing session number four, uh, which is for the Faculty of Education. And uh, before I can start the session, I just want to confirm if our two presenters are present in the room. Um, NG Mariri and uh, J. Asavella and their lecturers. They're not here. But I, I, 
I was told that the first presentation for this session will be online, so we have a recording, right? And um, there is a high possibility that this session is going to be the shortest of our sessions today because we do not have presenter number two. So um, it's just only one. Okay. All right. So this is how the session is going to go. And just like the previous sessions, we're going to have the presenter. And because they are online, we'll give them a chance to present and then we'll take questions after that presentation. The first presenter for session number four is NG Mariri, and they will be presenting on transforming multimedia presentation design practices in a health sciences first year module. Um, and it's a reflective case study. So we're going to hand over to NG Mariri, who will be doing an online presentation. Let's welcome them with a round of applause. Greetings, everyone. My name is Ntafi Gerald Mariri. Greetings everyone, my name is Ntafi Gerald Mariri and I thank you for giving audience to this presentation of a reflective case study wherein I critically reflected upon my use of multimedia presentations in transforming a health sciences first year subject that I lecture. This study was conducted under the supervision of Dr. Angela Stott with the title Transforming Multimedia Presentation Design Practices in a Health Science First Year Model. This presentation is structured that I first highlight the need for transformation in higher education, then briefly outline how multimedia can be used to transform the teaching practices in higher education. Then I will present to you the research questions that the study was formulated to answer, as well as the method that I used to achieve the aims and objectives of the research. And this will be followed by a presentation of our findings and finally conclude the presentation with meaningful conclusions and recommendations and acknowledge the contribution and efforts of certain individuals and organizations. In South Africa, the period after the 27th April 1994 is widely regarded as an ongoing period of transformation. Achieving transformation, specifically in higher education, requires consistent changes in the teaching and learning processes to empower both the teachers and the students to address the developmental needs of the society. As a result, the design of instructions required for transformative learning must cater for the requirements of human cognitive architecture processes, in turn, making active learning possible. The adoption of multimedia in teaching improves cognitive abilities, accelerates memorization and learning, and therefore, making it easier to understand abstract entities. Multimedia learning refers to the processes involved with the constructing of mental models from both verbal and visual elements as used in instructional material. Visual material creates concrete cognitive constructs, improves understanding of the theoretical components and application of high order thinking skills as required in science related subjects. The world over, there is an overwhelming change in the way human beings live, learn, work, and relate to each other. 
these fundamental changes in human development are marked by extraordinary technological advances which are occurring at an unprecedented pace and integrated the physical, digital, and biological realms concerned with how human beings develop, including how they learn. Nevertheless, most of the curricula and teaching practices adopted in higher education institutions are not updated and transformed to align with these rapid advances in the everyday use of technology by human beings. The use of multimedia in teaching is associated with improved cognitive abilities and speeds up the memorization and learning processes of students and consequently facilitates the comprehension of abstract entities. However, the transformation of teaching practices from the traditional chalkboard writing and in talk and chalk to the use of Microsoft PowerPoint presentation slides has the potential of decreasing student participation and performance during lectures, which is one of the prerequisites for outcome-based learning. It, against, it is against this background that this study intended to transform the teaching pedagogy adopted in the first year health sciences module. This transformation is sought to be guided by the multimedia presentation principles of Richard Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia learning. This research study sought to answer the following main research question. How can the multimedia presentation design practices in a health sciences first year module be transformed? The study also sought to answer the following two sub-questions. Firstly, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats associated with the current multimedia presentation practices in the health sciences first year module? Then we also looked to answer the question, how can the current multimedia presentation practices used in this module be improved? The aim of this study was to determine how to transform the multimedia presentation design practices in a health science first year module. The study had the following objectives, to explore the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats associated with the current multimedia presentation practices in a health sciences first year module. Then to determine how to improve the current multimedia presentation practices as used in a health sciences first year module. This reflective case study was underpinned by the theoretical principles of Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which is founded on the principles of Pavio's theory of dual coding, as well as the cognitive load theory now, according to Pavio's dual coding theory, working memory has two separate channels, one for processing images and the other one for processing words. However, the cognitive load theory maintains that each of these channels of working memory have a limited capacity of processing information at a given time. Therefore, if the available space in one channel, for example, the text channel, is unused, it cannot be reassigned to overload in the other channel, for instance, image channel. Now, Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia learning maintains that the active processes of the filtering, selecting, organizing, and integrating information is based on prior knowledge. Ultimately, the multimedia learning theory has 12 principles which guides us on how to effectively structure multimedia presentations to maximize learning. And these principles are categorized according to how students process information. In this study, we adopted an instrumental case study and mixed method approach to gain insight into the transformation 
of my teaching slides and draw generalizations from them on. We collected data by evaluating the lecturing slides against the criteria developed from Mayer's design principles of multimedia learning. Quantitative data was collected using a five-point Likert scale ranging from never to always, while qualitative data was collected from the description of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to the use of multimedia in transforming my teaching practices. The quantitative data collected through artifacts analysis of all the different sets of teaching slides used in the subject in question was analyzed using descriptive statistics, which was in interpreted and reported as the frequency of concept implementation. Meanwhile, the qualitative data collected from the sort analysis of the use of multimedia in transforming my teaching practices was analyzed using the content analysis approach and subsequently categorized into four themes. To establish validity, reliability, credibility, as well as trustworthiness, the study was underpinned by the theoretical principles of the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Additionally, qualitative and quantitative data were collected and analyzed simultaneously, and the resulting data was then integrated during the interpretation phase following the principles of triangulation. The interrater reliability technique was also used to measure the consistency used to evaluate the extent to which the researcher and an independent senior lecturer agree in their assessment decisions. The study complied with all the required ethical principles. The evaluation of the multimedia presentation practices used in the investigated module has shown that the current presentation practices adhere to Mayer's principles for managing essential processing in multimedia learning. These include the segmenting, pre-training, and modality principles of multimedia learning. Because these principles are concerned with managing the intrinsic cognitive load, this means that the researcher effectively presents the information in a manner that the students require less cognitive effort to understand and therefore are able to commit basic and complex concepts to their working memories. The evaluation of the multimedia presentation practices used in the investigated module has shown that the current presentation practices adhere to Mayer's principles for minimizing extraneous cognitive load in multimedia learning. These include the coherence, signaling, and spatial contiguity principles of multimedia learning. This means that the teacher effectively presents information in a manner that the students do not waste cognitive effort on content that, that does not support their intended learning outcome. Finally, the researchers' presentation practices were found to adhere to the applicable principles for reducing germane cognitive load in multimedia learning, specifically the multimedia principle of multimedia learning. This means that the teacher effectively presents information in a manner that assists students to easily understand and commit their learning into the long term. The qualitative findings of this study have revealed that the overall strength of the multimedia presentation design practices adopted in the investigated module is mostly the implementation of the principles that successfully reduce extraneous cognitive load. Furthermore, these results indicate that within the majority of the different sets of teaching slides, the instructional design had shortcomings 
in effectively enhancing germane cognitive load for the students by effectively managing intrinsic load. This is because the instructional material mainly presented information through written text. Although the written text does not use full sentences and support the intended learning outcome, the exclusion of appropriate images means that the available space in the image processing channel of the working memory is not utilized and is therefore wasted. This data therefore suggests that the opportunities to transform the multimedia presentation design practices in this subject in question lie in adopting instructional design techniques that include images. However, these opportunities may be threatened by the fact that the designer would have to source relevant Im images, which could be time consuming and might incur some costs if there are no appropriate images available in the public domain. In conclusion, we have found that higher education institutions rely on outdated curricula and teaching practices, and that the use <coughs> of multimedia in teaching can enhance cognition and comprehension. However, the transition to multimedia presentations like Power, PowerPoint may hinder student engagement if not done correctly. Therefore, our study aimed to transform the pedagogy in a first year health sciences module guided by Richard Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Subsequently, the areas of improvement and those requiring reinforcement were identified and addressed. With this, we have come to the conclusion of this presentation. And in the following slides, I present to you a list of acknowledgments to all the contributors to this project. And a list of references consulted in the formulation of this presentation. With this, I thank you so very much for your attentive attention. Thank you so much. Mm. In, in, in Northern Sesotho, when you are happy with an outcome like this one, we say, we why meaning that now it's time for me to pat myself on the back. I mean, um, the presentation for me is really poignant um, given what is being presented here about transforming teaching and learning practices. Um, I'm not gonna point fingers. <laughs> Should I point fingers as well? Because I mean, I saw in the conclusion that the presenter, you know, puts a spot a spotlight on outdated teaching practices, and um, because we are not going to have our second presenter, they are not here. Uh, perhaps I should just throw a question to the audience um, based on what has been presented here, and. Um, the first one will be a question to the audience. Anyone can answer if you feel like you know you have a contribution to make. And then the second one, I just want to make a comment and perhaps even ask my fellow librarians to reflect on that. So I just want to find out, based on this presentation here, to what extent do you as the audience um, think that the university is making progress in terms of transforming teaching and learning processes and practices in general. Any, any, any comment and feedback? Because I'm trying to uh, to make up for, for the absent presenter, right? So we might as well just have a conversation um, in the meantime. I see your hand there, sir. Welcome. All right. Okay. So I, I, I just want to find out to what extent 
do you think the university is making progress in terms of transforming teaching and learning processes and practices just in general? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the CTL uh, has a curriculum renewal program, uh, which I think I attended last year and it ran for two weeks and it's very, very important. So uh, if you want to uh, renew your curriculum, they, 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 they have a lot of uh, tools that they, they can suggest you use for, for teaching. However, from the presentation itself, I had a, a little bit of um, a curiosity, if I may put it that way, because I realized that the, 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 the researcher focused in health sciences. So the question that I had was, he didn't outline what was the problem, which I think perhaps maybe uh, his, um, uh, I mean, the reason why he's, he's specifically focused on health sciences, there might be a problem, but he didn't outline what was the problem. So I found that to be a challenge for, for me to follow what was actually the challenge in health sciences. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I wish I was here. I was <laughs> part of, um, I'm a librarian, so we are here to give them support. But um, yeah, but there, the, can I just follow up? I yeah. the presentation was very clear. It's just that that was my curiosity outside the scope of work. I was wondering what was the challenge, but thank you. Thank you for that. Any other input, comment, questions, comments, concerns? I see hands, two hands. Thank you. I want to comment on your question, teaching and learning practices. Uh, in addition to a quality set, we have a curriculum renewal program. Maybe we even need to start uh, at the strategy of the university, the learning and teaching strategy that is coming to an end this year. We will be reviewing the strategy. So that has intentions within that to transform teaching, but also transformation starts with the person. It starts with the lecturer, it starts with the students. And I think um, there are students who spoke about curriculum transformation. Uh, we also talk about curriculum co-creation. So it's important that students need to know that they have the right to participate in the curriculum creation. But it, it will not just happen if we don't start conversations like this. So I think strategies are a lot but it needs us to start working on them and implementing them. Thank you. Um, so this is just a note on my personal journey. Um, I spoke about Dr. Benjamin Buerta. He has yeah, did, made his PhD last year um, and his master's was also a VR application, but based on a health science um, kind of a situation where a patient has an obstructed ob obstruction in the lung and that um, enabled the nursing students to work on a virtual patient. Um, it gave them a lot more opportunities to um, experience certain scenarios and I feel like that opened up a huge array of, of let's say situations that these um, health science and especially nursing students they need to interact with, but th there are a lot of limitations when it comes to those kinds of things. So that was really interesting. And I feel like there's a lot of opportunities where we can take VR into education, especially when it comes to real world limitations as well as risks. Um, you do not get the full experience with uh, a simulation. Um, so with VR, it in immensely enhances the experience for students. So I feel like, um, VR can definitely assist in these kind of more risky situations that students need to need to encounter in the in their studies, um, especially in undergraduate. So um, I'm excited to see what what this will bring for the future. Thank you so much for for the input. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna wrap up the session. But before I do that, I promise that I want to just share some something for, for reflection. Um, uh, one uh, commentator said that uh, um, transforming the curriculum or the teaching and learning practices and the processes must start with the person. 
So I just want to perhaps leave this with my fellow librarians. Um, we 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 have a teaching and learning division in the in the library and in information services department, and most of the time we focus on what we call one shot sessions, and there are a number of reasons why. Um, the first one being time constraints. We don't have time to do you know to be pedagogical, to be innovative enough. Um, but I just want to ask if uh, from my fellow librarians and perhaps everyone. Um, how 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 do we move forward in terms of reflecting on our teaching and learning practices so that we can, you know, spotlight the student voice, you know, make sure that we do not just see our students as empty shells that need to be filled, um, to make sure that we bring them along, you know, to co-create um, um, uh, knowledge as well. So I'm just going to leave that um, to my fellow librarians, just reflect on that. And um, um, because we do not really have um, the second presenter, and I, I'm just going to find out, is there any other question um, from, from the floor before we can wrap up the session? There is a question. Thank you so much. It's not a question, it's um, just a comment on the last thing that you said. There's something very cool that they do at the Dharma department, where at the end of the year, there is a person from outside that comes and sits down with the students to just ask um, questions about the curriculum, questions about the experiences with the lecturers, with the curriculum. Um, and I think, it just, it makes you seen as a student. Um, and it's just, yes, I just wanted to comment on that. They do that. I don't know if maybe every department does that, or maybe it's because we are such a small department, hence they do that. But I appreciate that. I just wanted to say that. All right, thank you so much. Um colleagues. So um, I'm just going to now wrap up the session. Um, thank you so much for the input. Um, we we're supposed to have the second speaker, um, and they were going to present on uh, transforming formative assessment in a construction roadworks short learning program, and it was also a reflective case study by J.R. Savell. Unfortunately, they are not here to present, so I'm going to now hand over to the program director to continue. Let's give our presenter another round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Mashlava. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, one more session before we head on to the lunch break. May I kindly call uh, Mr. Zinak Ilesoku, who is going to lead a session on difficulty of law. Mr. Zinak Ile. Yeah, thank you. Let me first thank you, uh, Program Director, and I must greet everyone in the house. Uh, I'm going to uh, share this session. Uh, we have two uh, uh, students from the Faculty of Law that will be presenting. Unfortunately, due to certain circumstances, the first presenter have sent a, a, a presentation which will be now be played online. And she has been supervised by Mr. Kanya Mutsadi, who said I'm also apologized on his behalf. Uh, he is engaged with other engagements of the faculty. And the student that will be presenting online today also, she is not available online. And I'll be standing for her and also for Mr. Mutsadi. 
if there are any questions. And the student is from the Faculty of Law, the Department of Public Law. And the title of her research is New National Movement, which is the case versus the President of the Republic of South Africa, which was set in the Constitutional Court in 2020, which as I'm speaking to now, it was challenged in the electoral, I mean, the Constitutional Court, and you are waiting for the president because everything you stand still. And if this amendment bill is not being passed, it means this year we are not going to vote uh, because of this bill, which is right in the table of the president. And then it only awaits for the president to sign and then it, becoming, it becomes the legislation. So we are going to play uh, the presentation of Mrs. Tulwana Musia. And the procedure will be the same from both students. That is, she is physically here and the one online. All the questions will be asked after the second presenter. Thank you. Good day, everybody. And thank you for having me. My name is Tulana Musia, and I will be presenting the assignment that I submitted for the final year law module, Advanced Constitutional Law, titled New Nation Movement, NPC and Others v. President of the Republic of South Africa and Others 2020. I hope you enjoy. In the New Nation Movement case, the Constitutional Court declared the Electoral Act unconstitutional to the extent that it does not provide for independent candidates to stand for political office in the national and provincial legislature. This, the court held, limits fundamental constitutional rights. The effect of this is that it requires adult citizens to be elected through the National Assembly and provincial legislatures only through their membership of a political party. The court held that this unjustifiably limits the right to stand for political office and if elected, hold political office as conferred by section 193b of the constitution by limiting the right exclusively to adult citizens who do so through membership of a political party. The right to freedom of association is also unjustifiably infringed. These two rights are inextricably linked because in order to exercise one right, that is the right to hold office, one has to forfeit the other, that is the right to freely associate. This is because the right to freely associate includes the right not to associate or to disassociate. Following this decision by the Constitutional Court, Parliament was tasked with, with amending the Act so as to allow adult citizens to stand and hold public office in the National Assembly and provincial legislatures independently without membership of a political party. This assignment considers Parliament's flawed response oh both in procedure and substance to the task of amending the Act so as to realize the rights of independent candidates in South Africa. The Amendment Act represents a missed opportunity for electoral reform, not only to bring agency and hope to the disillusioned and despondent electorate, but also to amend the electoral system, which is a once in a one or two generations opportunity. I will be addressing the importance of an electoral system, especially in a country like South Africa, and what is required of the amendment bill that Parliament was tasked to draw. An electoral system determines the rules according to which an, elect an election is conducted and the process by which votes are translated into the distribution of governmental authority. It creates a framework by means of which the political wishes of a population is reflected and elections are the fundamental point of departure in any democratic government. Specifically in the context of South Africa, where the political system was manipulated by means of an electoral system that was unfair and denied the vast majority of South Africans the right, the right to enjoy. In South Africa, an electoral system that is free and fair is not only important for nationhood and democracy, but is a badge of dignity and personhood for every South African. In South Africa, the electoral system is provided for by the Electoral Act. Prior to the amendment of the Act, 
South Africa used a pure proportional electoral system with a closed list, in terms of which the division of seats in the National Assembly and the provincial legislature is determined in proportion to the actual support that a party receives. Proportional representation aims to ensure that a proportionate ratio is found between the votes received and the seats allocated. The principle behind proportional representation is a representative body should be able to be the people as a map is to the country it represents. And it allows opinions of minority parties to be more actively reflected. In order to understand exactly where Parliament fell short in the Amendment Act, we need to see what exactly was required of them. It was required that the Amendment Act be compliant with constitutional norms, result in equality for political parties, independent candidates and for voters, that the Act ensures free and fair elections, that, is, that there is a rational relationship between the scheme which Parliament adopts and the achievement of a legitimate purpose, and that it results in general in a proportional representation. Next, I will be dealing with the defects or the flaws in the amendment bill the Parliament drafted. The first is the concerns in the process leading to the passing of the bill. The general attitude displayed by Parliament was that of apathy and not taking into account the importance um, and giving the appropriate weight and urgency to the matter. The Constitutional Court gave Parliament 24 months to amend the bill, but due to delays of the minister and his committee, it meant that the court had to grant a six month extension to Parliament on two separate occasions, which is a full year extension in order to carry on, in order to complete drafting the bill. This also meant that there was a reduction in public participation leading up to the drafting of the bill. And the outcome of the bill meant that the public had no substantive choice in the electoral system that was going to be adopted. The second flaw is the three ballot system that was implemented in terms of the electoral system that has been introduced by Parliament. The three ballot system means that independent candidates can only contest 200 seats in the National Assembly and political parties can contest all 400 seats in the National Assembly. This means that province-sized constituencies would be too large to permit the intimate relationship to enable responsiveness and accountability through parliamentarians and the electorate. This also has the effect that independent candidates would find it unfairly difficult to compete effectively against resource parties in these large constituencies. Additionally, that it would also increase the amount of ballots that would need to be counted by the IEC in the national elections, which would add an increased toll on the already heavy burden that the IEC is under during national elections in South Africa. Another flaw with the amendment bill is the principle and effect of wasted votes. An electoral threshold or quota is the minimum share or amount of all votes cast that a candidate or party requires to secure a seat in the National Assembly or Provincial Legislature. The fewer the votes cast, the higher the threshold. Since an independent candidate may only be elected to one seat, the votes cast for such candidates which exceed this threshold are discarded. Effectively throwing away votes negates the principle of one person, one vote, and the notion that everybody's vote counts. This also has the effect of disproportionality, since the amount of votes cast do not reflect the amount of seats, the amount of seats allocated to each party. This also disadvantages small parties as the threshold is increased in order to get a seat in the National Assembly or the Provincial Legislature. Lastly, the bill undermines meaningful and equal participation by requiring independent candidates to obtain significantly more signatures, 6,550 signatures, to register as a candidate than a political party who only require 1,000 signatures. With regard to vacating seats, if an independent candidate were to vacate their position once elected, the bill allows for a recalculation that could result in a seat being filled by a political party instead of the vacancy being filled through a by-election. 
the time of writing this assignment, many civil society organizations and citizens refused to ignore the bill in light of the upcoming 2024 elections. However, efforts to challenge the bill have not gone far and the proposed electoral system will be implemented for the 2024 elections, with many independent candidates contesting seats in the National Assembly and Provincial Legislature. The effect that this bill will have on the elections, the results thereof, and the constitutional rights of all is yet to be seen. Thank you for listening to my presentation and thank you to Mr. Mutabi for submitting my paper. And thank you again, Program Director. Uh, this time I'm going to call Mrs. Mamelo Musia, Masia, sorry for that, from McIntyre Law. But before I do that, let me apologize for a prof, Denin Smith, who is currently not available today due to other engagement. So I'll also be standing on her behalf. Uh, Mrs. Musia is from Mercantile Law and she'll be presenting uh, today with the title read as The Last Straw, Workplace Bullying and Constructive Dismissal, a South African Labour Study. Uh, I will call upon Mrs. Musia to come in front. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here to share my story with you. Once dignity may be vandalized, cruelly mocked, and assaulted, but it can never be taken away unless it is surrendered. Bullying in the workplace is a persistent issue in South African workplaces, and it is a contravention of Section 10 of, this, of the Constitution of South Africa because it, it violates the victim's dignity. A study in 2012 shows that 30.5% of employees were bullied in South African workplaces. It's 2004. You can just imagine if such a study were to be conducted again, how much the, the numbers would have increased. So today we are dealing with employers who are the bullies. When your employer bullies you to a point where you find it intolerable, you find yourself resigning. But the issue with that is that you claim constructive dismissal. However, such a dismissal is very difficult for you to prove at the CCMA and the courts. So today, I want to share with you the importance of us finding that constructive dismissals might not be the right course of action. And we need to see if there are other avenues that employees can explore in order to deal with this matter. I used a, doctr a doctrinal research design for my research paper, and I did that by critically sorry, critically evaluating uh, pieces of legislation, as well as secondary sources like books and articles that dealt with constructive dismissal and workplace bullying. So the main question is, of course, how can workplace bullying be alleviated in order to reduce or rather in order for employees not to resort to constructive dismissal claims? And the following questions, I looked into them in depth. What is workplace bullying and constructive dismissal and what is the link between both these concepts? What is the stance of the International Labour Organization on both of them? Also, what is the South, the South African legal um, tools that govern workplace bullying and constructive dismissal? 
So workplace bullying is defined in the new harassment code as aggressive behavior that is continuous, that injures or harms an individual. It is also regarded as unfair discrimination according to section six of the EEA, but then I will deal with that later in the presentation. So there are negative outcomes of workplace bullying and we need to know them. Over time, when your employer is harassing you and bullying you, you will eventually probably get clinical depression. You will end up having stress as well as not performing well at work. So it can also be in the form of assault, sexual harassment, it can be threats, insults, also being ignored or being left out, also being hu humiliated in public, that is also part of workplace bullying. Constructive dismissals, on the other hand, are governed by the Labor Relations Act under section 186.1e. And this is a type of dismissal where uh, the employee is the one that initiates the termination on the ground that the employer made it intolerable for them to continue working there. And then the, the, the requirements that have to be made, the stringent requirements that have to be made by, that have to be met by employees to prove constructive dismissal, they are as follows. There has to be an employment relationship that was in existence at the time of the resignation. The employee must have been the one that ended the employment relationship. The working conditions must have been intolerable, made so by the employer. And all of this, this heavy burden of proof is on the employee. So I have a very important case to share with you today, and it is the Center for Autism Research and Education CC versus CCMA, where we had two special needs teachers that were bullied by the employer, Ms. Ribak. And she made derogatory remarks to them. She made unlawful pay deductions. She made sexual hints, and the list goes on. They had to prove beyond reasonable doubt that they were bullied because you cannot just go to the court and say, I feel like I was bullied. No, you have to prove it beyond reasonable doubt and provide concrete evidence. The employer went as far as calling them names. She even referred to one of them as a goblin and to the other as a screaming queen. So in this case, they claimed constructive dismissal, right? Um, but then the reason why they were able to succeed is because obviously they, they proved successfully the workplace bullying. And secondly, they were able to prove the constructive dismissal. But the court emphasized that all internal procedures have to be followed. You cannot resort to a resignation before you make sure that you file a grievance and it is dealt with accordingly. Otherwise, constructive dismissal, you might as well forget about it. It will not succeed. So we have the International Labor Organization, which is an international uh, convention. And it adopted the ILO convention number 190 in 2019, which addresses harassment at work. So it identifies workplace bullying as harassment or violence in the workplace. And it also gave a definition, so I will briefly touch on it. It refers to harassment as a range of unacceptable behaviors or practices or threats that result in physical, psychological, or sexual or economic harm. So we need to know where does the ILO protect us as employees, right? And it, it, uh, it includes domestic and uh, domestic workers as well as uh, workers in the rural areas. So it is very broad. It is important for you to know that when you are on a business related travel and you get harassed by your employer, you can definitely uh, claim constructive dismissal because they are harassing you within the scope of work. Then you also have to um, bear in mind that you are also protected even in the changing room, even when you're having lunch, even when you're traveling for work, even when you are at a, an accommodation where the employer supplies you with it. So South Africa is a member of the ILO and it is obligated to share or rather to make the standards be aligned with the ILO. So it has to amend its legislations to incorporate the ILO principles into them by 
making sure that trade unions collaborate with employees and employers associations or organizations to deal with workplace bullying, to deal with these risks that we have in our workplaces and the dangers that come with that. So we need programs, we need awareness programs, we need training and education. Then the ILO Convention number 111, also known as the C111, deals with discrimination, but there still need to be an expansion of the list of prohibited grounds for discrimination. So workplace bullying is still yet to be incorporated into this convention. The ILO Convention number 158 deals with termination of employment. However, it only deals with the, the, the type of termination where the employer is the one that initiates the termination of the contract. But it does not deal with constructive dismissal, however, because constructive dismissal is where the employee terminates the relationship, the, the employment relationship. So the South African legal instruments that we have that govern both these concepts is the harassment code, right? And the harassment code does uh, regard bullying as unfair discrimination uh, under the limitation of Section 6 of the Employment Act to Act, which is a problem because bullying is a, a thing on its own, but now the harassment says we do cater for bullying. However, we do so under the shadow of harassment, under the shadow of unfair discrimination. Then we have the Employment Equity Act. And the section 6.1 of the Employment Equity Act is the one that lists the grounds of discrimination, the prohibited grounds of discrimination. However, bullying is not there. Even if you go and check, you will not see the word bullying there, which is a problem and it makes it very difficult for us to deal with as employees when we are faced with workplace bullying. Then there is this uh, exception that we have under the EEA, section 16. It states that if your HR manager, for example, because your HR manager um, represents your employer, if your HR manager is the one who is harassing you, then and you file a grievance, but it is not dealt with accordingly, then you can then sue the employer and hold the employer accountable. The Labor Relations Act under Section 186.1e, as emphasized earlier on, talks about a constructive dismissal that has to occur on the basis of in the, an intolerable working condition. But now what is intolerable? That LRA does not give us a clear definition of intolerability, what exactly it entails, unfortunately. But when we look at the Anglo-American case, the, the, the court itself on a case-by-case -case basis tried to see what exactly is unacceptable behavior by the employer because it's not defined in the LRA. And this case, the, the judge in this specific case highlighted that, okay, we're going to look at the employer's actions. And if they pose potential harm that is irreparable, then that is intolerable. But again, you, the employee, have to prove intolerability on your own and convince the court. The Ferrodo case, so let's say you, you ended up succeeding with constructive dismissal, right? You proved workplace bullying, you, you proved you met the requirements of constructive dismissal, but now before the court could award you compensation, it has to consider more factors. Do you need the money? Do you need it? You have to prove that you suffered financial loss and you have to prove that you tried looking for alternative uh, uh, employment. And if not, if you do not meet the requirements according to this one, then it's more emotional trauma for you. The Occupational Health and Safety Act under Section 5 states that the employers have a responsibility to the extent that it is reasonably practic practical, practicable. Every employer must provide and maintain a working environment that is safe and without risk to the health of the employees. Workplace bullying is a risk to the employees. So I say that it should govern, this particular act should also govern workplace bullying. So the summary, basically, we see that the shortcomings of the statutes in defining workplace bullying constructive dismissal make it challenging for employees to know exactly how to go about it. They are there, they provide for these, but then they are not clear. 
And then we also saw that the ILO is very important, right? So South Africa still needs to do a lot of work. It needs to develop uh, its legislations, the EEA, the LRA, to make sure that it is upholding the international standards of reducing harassment in the workplace. Then, of course, we saw that the EEA does not list uh, uh, does not list workplace bullying as a listed ground, right? So it should do that to facilitate the process of claiming constructive dismissal. And the LRA, we found that it does not identify exactly what intolerable behavior is. Again, we have to think for ourselves as the employees, right? The, har the harassment code does give a definition of workplace bullying under item 4.7.7. But the fact that it does that in the shadow of unfair, unfair discrimination, why? So it still makes it very challenging. We need to be transparent about bullying as it is. So honestly, when we come to this point, we need to realize that let's rather not have workplace bullying. Because when we have workplace bullying, we're going to be compelled to resign, lose our jobs. And on top of that, we're going to try and get compensation. Oh my word, now I have to deal with constructive dismissal, proving it more stress. So there were recommendations, of course, and the ILO recommendation number 206 goes hand in hand with the C190 that I mentioned earlier on. And it recommends that employers should work with trade unions to set up workplace bullying policies, specifically workplace bullying policies in an effort to combat this, should I say, what is it, disease? It's a virus, right? And an integrated approach will protect all employees from different sectors, and it should be gender responsive, it should include everyone, because even males, they also get harassed. It's not only us women, it should include everyone, everyone. And also, the Occupational Health and Safety Act should definitely regulate workplace bullying. And then restorative practice, this is a very important one. It was suggested by legal, legal, various legal scholars like Susan Duncan. And it focuses on healing, it focuses on mediation between the perpetrator and the victim, right? So instead of having the employment relationship broken so severely, restorative practice will restore it through healing through addressing the core issues of the problem. And then section 6.1 of the Employment Equity Act should include bullying as a listed ground. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again. Uh program director, and I must also thank the, both uh, the presenter who's not here physically, and also uh, Mrs. Musia, Masia, sorry for that. Uh, both presenters, they have touched on important issues that affect our daily lives. One, the one presented online, if the president doesn't sign, and why this has been hidden, and now there must be some amendments, or now there must be some uh, changes or reviews in our Electoral System Act. Only when individuals, which according to the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, Section 23, are being protected, and also the uh, the, uh, the Bill of Rights, Section 7, 1, in brackets, states clearly that is that section make it clear that it, uh, democracy is the cornerstone and the dignity of each and every individual must be respected. And each individual must have a freedom and a choice. But in that case, not only the rights of, that, of those uh, candidates, were infringed, but were undermined and excluded according to the constitution, which is there to protect each and every individual. And coming again to uh, Ms. Musia, thank you. You have said it uh, mouthful. Uh, this 
is an open eye for us that we should know very clearly. You don't just claim constructive dismissal without having facts or follow the procedure according to the legislation, which the last one is trying to protect your rights that you must not be dismissed because you became the victim of the day. It makes it clearly that if an employer is bullying you, firstly, don't resign. You must follow the procedure and make it a point that all the remedies within the legislation are being followed. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you resign. You are the one who's going to suffer the loss. Uh, I'm expecting there are comments, not only questions, both from presenters, the one online and uh, Mrs. Musia, who is here at uh, this time. Uh, I'll say you are welcome to pose any question or to pose any, any suggestions. There's a question at the back. Thank you to, to the both presentation. Um, so there's, there's, there's macro, there's meso stuff. Let's bring it back to university. And let's leave an adult when we talk to a student. So you use the same generic principles and we try to test it on student at university of the free state in particular. A bill of rights, students have their own politics, they have to go through electoral processes. What does this mean? We, we often have to halt classes because there are institutional policies, practices, legislation, legislation pieces that are not, in people's humble views, legal views, aligned with what would be um, what's actually inscribed in the Bill of Rights. So I, I need to be educated about, about that. We, we obviously educate students to become critical citizens, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I want, I want to see how, how we can test this, this generic notion on, on, on a very small scale like the University of the Free State. That's one question for the first presentation. Second presentation is also for me, um, speaking to generic staff issues. Let's talk about same principles and we test notions of, um, you know, we, we continuously sit with students that, that 